Okay. And can you uh, put in the chat when it's, uh, oh, it says webinar is now streaming live on custom live streaming service. So does that, that must mean that we are live. Okay. Yeah. And can you uh, put in the chat when it's, uh, oh, it said webinar is now streaming live on custom live streaming service. Okay. So does that, that must mean that we are live. Okay. Great. We are live on YouTube. Good morning, Sharla. Hey, Sharla, can you unmute so we can check your audio real quick? Am I coming through? Yep, perfect. Awesome. Sound good, look good. Nice to see you. Well, what do you say, team? Are we ready to kick this meeting off? 9.01. Excellent. Let's do it. Great. Can you go ahead and put our slides up? Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Statewide Toll Rule Advisory Committee, uh, more affectionately known as the STRAC. Uh, this is our first meeting, and uh, welcome to all of our live stream viewers. We appreciate you tuning in today, and welcome to all our STRAC members who have taken time out of their busy schedules to join us. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So STRAC members, we have gone through our Zoom meeting tips. It's always good to just uh, remind ourselves of what our capabilities are. So we do ask that uh, you keep yourself on mute. We've already done audio and video check. And um, as I mentioned, you know, use your video as much as possible. Uh, we understand that there's Zoom fatigue and you, know, you need to take a break and so just, uh, Use your video as much as you can, but we understand when you need to turn it off. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So we've asked everyone to uh, rename themselves and you can do that or just make sure that your name is accurate and that you're identified as a STRAC member. Um, it's helpful to put your pronouns in as well. And you can do that by going down to the participants, clicking on your name and going over to the little dots and um, you'll get an option to name yourself. Now, the other capabilities that we'll have available to you are the chat. The chat is going to be open. Uh, I do ask that you not have substantive conversations in the chat. It, it, that really does, it acts just like a side conversation in an in-person meeting. Um, it's distracting. It's difficult for us to follow. Our live stream viewers can't see the chat, and so then they don't know what kind of conversation or questions are being asked. So we ask that you use the chat to let us know if you need to leave, if you're having technical difficulties, if you need to direct message one of us about something that we can help you with. Um, and there'll be, they'll, but otherwise, we'll, you know, please don't use the chat. Just try to raise your hand and, uh, and speak. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, if you'd like to access the closed captions, there's a closed caption um, option available to you at the bottom of your screen. You can click on the CC icon and a separate window with captions will appear. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, for our live stream viewers, again, welcome and thank you for tuning in. Uh, this meeting is being recorded, and so you'll have an opportunity to go back and revisit this. Um, if you would like to make comments for the STRAC, then you can email the Oregon Tool Rules at odot.oregon.gov with STRAC public comment in the subject line. Um, all the public comments will be uh, sent to the STRAC, so they will get to see those. Um, you can submit your comments by phone. There's a phone number here, 503-837-3536. And if your comments are received by 11 a.m., one business day before each meeting, they'll be shared with the committee members before the meeting. And all comments will be added to the meeting record. So again, thank you for joining us and uh, spending some time with us today. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So here's our, here's our run of show. Uh, we're going to spend our time together. Uh, we've got some welcome and introductions. So everybody can get a chance to hear who's on the project team and hear who is on the track. 
Uh, we have a diversity, equity, and inclusion training because this is important work as we're creating a new system and program that we're working with a DEI lens. Uh, there's a toll program overview. We'll take a, a brief break. Uh, actually, there's a morning break as well between the DEI training and the toll program overview, just a brief five minute stretch break. Um, at 11.50, we'll take a little bit longer um, lunch break so folks can grab a, a sandwich, something to eat, and then come back. We do have a working lunch planned. At uh, 12.05, the STRAC overview will be a fair amount of listening, so you'll have some time to, to eat. Um, at one o'clock, we'll walk through the STRAC charter um, that was sent out to you in advance. We'll put it up on the screen. We can make edits in real time. We just wanna make sure people understand and are comfortable with the, uh, with the charter. Uh, we'll have some Q and A, just you know, anything else on people's minds, um, other other things that we haven't gotten to before we wrap up at two forty-five, and we'll be done at three. And we'll, we we will there will be uh, Q and A opportunities throughout the day as well, and we'll make that clear uh, before each of the presentations. Since today is an orientation meeting, there's a lot of listening, a lot of pre presenting. We have built in several interactive um, activities to try to break it up a bit and to hear a little bit more from everybody, but it is a heavy presentation day today. So we have a few meeting guidelines. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. These should be familiar to folks. They're um, pretty pretty basic guidelines that we just asked folks to adhere to. Uh, so this for STRAC members, we ask that you fully participate in work group meetings. You know, lots of, many people were uh, considered for this STRAC and, and um, the re one of the reasons why you're here is because we want to hear your voice. We want to hear about the interest in the community that you represent. So we're hoping um, that you'll feel comfortable speaking up. Um, we're hoping that you've had a chance to look through the materials that we set in advance. Um, and we ask that you come prepared for meetings. And we'll talk about that a little bit later when we walk through the charter. Uh, we ask that people participate in an open and mutually respectful way. Um, this is a very diverse group of folks on our STRAC, a wide range of opinions and um, experience with tolling, experience with, with uh, transportation. Uh, people won't agree and we don't necessarily expect you to. Um, and so we just ask that you be open and listen uh, respectfully. Balanced speaking time. Um, we do have some folks on the rack that have a lot of experience with this. And I think the tendency would be to share that knowledge and we want to hear what you have to say, but we also wanna make space for folks um, who are getting up to speed or who have questions um, and, and, and want to share information from their communities as well. Um, and again, so the serving as a liaison to your larger community of interest, this track is each one of you represents a, a geographic area, a um, subject matter expertise, a community of interest, um, and we're hoping that you can bring those perspectives uh, to the table. And then act in good faith, listen and be respectful of others' contributions. So let's go ahead and go to the next. We've got a, a little welcome here from Travis. Travis, let's go ahead and hear from you. Great, thank you, Jamie. I am here to welcome all of you to the STRAC today. I'm Travis Brower, the ODOT Assistant Director for Revenue Finance Compliance. Uh, and so I uh, oversee the toll program implementation work that is being undertaken by ODOT, an executive sponsor of this group. So on behalf of ODOT and Director Strickler, uh, welcome aboard. We're glad to have you here today. We're grateful for your interest and your investment of time. Uh, we'll be asking a lot of you over the next six to nine months. We're glad you've been willing to sign up. I'm very excited about this group and what each of you are going to bring to the table. I was really impressed by the caliber of the individuals who applied to be on this track. Uh, I think we got a great group of smart people who can really help us uh, work through some of these issues and help us build a stronger toll program. Overall, you're going to bring the voice of the customers into this conversation uh, for those who are going to interact with the toll program and really help us do better than we would be if we didn't have that voice of the customers uh, as we develop and build this system. You know, individually, you are all picked for your unique perspectives based on your experience and expertise and who you represent. And I'm excited that we were able to gather a very uh, diverse group, you know, in terms of your, your backgrounds. You have the geography represented here today, uh, as well as demography. Uh, we have a diverse group of people in, in multiple ways. And I'm really confident that all of those different, diverse, and individual perspectives will help us ensure that all voices are going to be heard around this table and that we have an equitable program 
uh, for Oregonians and others who use it. Tolling is really complex and complicated. Uh, and today we're gonna be turning on a fire hose of information at you. In fact, probably more like being blasted by several fire hoses simultaneously. So we recognize that that's gonna be uh, a lot of info coming at you, but we're gonna try to respect your time by, by giving you an overview at a fairly high level of the highlights of key topics. There's a lot more information available on the website. Uh, and of course, if you have questions, you can reach out to the project team and we can help get you the information you need. I, and I don't want you to be shy about speaking up uh, and noting that there's a, you know, a, a lack of information or a lack of understanding about a topic, because if you're feeling a lack of information or understanding, it may be that everybody else around the group is as well, because uh, we'll make some assumptions and they may not be valuable or valid about what everybody comes to the table knowing already. We have a great team from ODOT and our contractor, Kearns and West, uh, who we hired to facilitate this group. Uh, and really help us navigate through the rulemaking process as a fairly neutral party who can who can just work these issues and, and help us uh, make sure these meetings are, are run effectively. So with that, again, welcome. We really appreciate your time and your engagement and the knowledge you're going to bring to the table. And I will turn it back over to Jamie to continue the program. Great. Thanks, Travis. So now we're gonna turn our attention to you STRAC members. Uh, we have 17 STRAC members and we've got 16 of you um, with us today. And so we'd like you to each, so I want you to think about what we're gonna ask you in terms of introductions. And while you're thinking about that, we're gonna go ahead and introduce our project team. So for STRAC members, I'm gonna ask each of you to say your name, uh, the organization that you represent and your role and your geographic location, can, you know, where you're from. And then I want you to answer the question very briefly at the end of this process, I hope that. So I want you to think about that. And um, Madeline, if you can put that question, those three things, the things we're asking of STRAC members in the chat so they can all see and be thinking about that. So while you're thinking about that and uh, Madeline's putting that in the chat, we're gonna go to just two slides of an overview of who all this thank you of uh, where, actually before we go to the slides, let's hear from our project team before we go to the STRAC slides. So project team. So first let's hear from ODOT. So Travis, I'm gonna start with you and I'd like, you already introduced yourself, but can you, um, can you pass the baton to each of your key ODOT project team members for them to introduce themselves? Sure, I would be happy to. So why don't we start with uh, Garrett Pryor? Howdy, y'all. Uh, my name is Garrett Pryor, he, him pronouns. I'm ODOT's toll policy manager. Um, and like you've been seeing through the emails or other connections in our interviews, I'll be your kind of main uh, point of contact relationally for ODOT. Uh, so as you're about to hear from the, the rest of our team, uh, I can be a, a connector for that, for the information that comes into you uh, from the committee. Uh, so um, you don't have to have a, a runaround and <laughs> try to get to know everyone. So uh, delighted to be here. Thank you. Back to you, Travis. Great. Kelly Bruce, you want to go next? Sure. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I'm Kelly Bruce. I'm with uh, ODOT's Office of Organizational Excellence, and I'm basically an internal consultant on organizational strategy and process and have been uh, working to help bring you all on board for the last, I don't know, eight months. So I'm excited to, to be here today. Back to you, Travis. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, is Erica McAlpin here? All right, she'll be on later, so we'll get to meet her at that point. I'm here, you, Travis. Oh, sorry, there you are, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, I'm Erica McAlpha, and I'm the Assistant Director for the Office of Equity and Civil Rights. We're gonna hear quite a bit from Erica this morning, so she'll have a major role here today. Uh, Eric. Yeah, thanks, Travis. Uh, Eric Hovig, I'm the Statewide Policy and Planning Manager for ODOT. I help lead our long range policy work, but also how it folds into transportation planning at the community, regional and statewide level. So looking forward to this group and helping to support you. Great, and then Sean Nicola. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Travis. Uh, Sean Nicola, I'm, I'm with the Interstate Bridge Replacement Program. I'm the Project Delivery Manager for Tolling and just hoping to be able to help uh, assist in any way possible, thanks. Thanks, Sean. I think the last but not least is Hannah Williams. 
Good morning, Hannah Williams with ODOT, Community Engagement Coordinator for the Toll Projects. We have a wide variety of folks. You're going to see some other people as well at various meetings. Uh, you will likely hear and see from uh, folks like Mandy Putney, who is our tolling manager out of the uh, Office of Urban Mobility, uh, as well as some of the, her other team up in the Urban Mobility Office, including uh, Brendan Finn, as well as Della Mosier, are likely going to be people who, who come in and out of these meetings from time to time as key resources. So I think that is the ODOT team, Jamie. Great. Thanks, Travis. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself and our Kearns and West team. So I'm my name is Jamie Damon. I'm a vice president senior mediator with Kearns and West, and I'll be facilitating our STRAC meetings. And joining me to support the STRAC is Madeline. Madeline, introduce yourself. Hi, all. Uh, I'm Madeline Kane. I work with Kearns and West as a senior associate. Um, I'm in particular on this project because I'm also working on some of the engagement efforts surrounding the regional mobility pricing project. Um, and before I started working with Kearns and West, I was the rules coordinator at the Oregon Liquor Control Commission. Thank you, Madeline. And Violetta? Good morning, everyone. My name is Violetta. I usually hear pronouns. I'm a project coordinator at Kearns and West, and I'll be supporting the logistics of the track process. Thank you, Violetta. And helping us out today uh, is Ellen. Hi, everyone. Ellen Palmquist with Kearns and West. I use she, her pronouns. And uh, today I'll be helping out with some note taking. And I'm also involved in the STRAC engagement um, part of the team from, from Kearns, Kearns and West. Thanks, Ellen. And Amira? Hello, everyone. My name is Mira Streeter. I am part of the Kearns and West team, uh, she and her pronouns, and I will be helping with the STRAC engagement work. Yeah, and Amira is listening today. Thank you, Amira. Thanks, team. All right, STRAC members, it's your turn. Let's go ahead and turn to you. I'm going to call on you so we can do it in an orderly fashion. Hopefully, you've had a chance to take a look at the questions in the chat. And Madeline, can you go to the next slide showing the geographic uh, representation of this of this track. Great. So this is a statewide committee, as you know, we've talked about this in the one on one conversations we've had. Um, so just a quick map to show you where everyone is in Oregon. And then we've got uh, representatives in California, or not California, in Washington as well. And then we have a member from Pennsylvania. Um, so you'll be you'll be meeting him as well. So let's go to the next slide just to give you an overview of the interests that are represented. We've got small and local businesses, national and regional businesses, construction, freight and trucking, agriculture, emergency response, equity, minority and women-owned business, tourism, public safety, and commuters. We really, as you heard from Travis, we worked really hard to try to have a broad range of, of diverse and uh, representative interests uh, for this track. So we're glad you're all here. So let's go to the next slide. And we already put these in the, we already put these in the chat. So we're gonna take this slide down and I'm gonna call on each of you. So I'm gonna start with Ethan. And if you could un, uh, unmute and turn your video on, introduce yourself to us. So just double checking, can you see me? Yep, you look okay. coming through good, good. nice so over in the background. I have, yes, <laughs> those are some of the construction materials that uh, I am apparently representing. Um, my name is Ethan Hosenstein. I'm with Knife River Corporation. We are a publicly traded, vertically integrated uh, construction and construction materials company. We are Oregon's largest um, supplier of concrete and uh, con pre-stressed concrete and aggregates for the construction industry. Um, I have been listed as representing construction materials, but I actually have uh, sort of an interest in both construction materials as well as trucking. Uh, as you know, uh, construction materials don't move themselves, they go by truck um, primarily. So we are both a beneficiary of uh, highway funds in the sense that we get involved and work on a lot of uh, 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 state and uh, local um, transportation projects, but we are also a commercial and heavy commercial user of Oregon's highway system. 
Uh, my home office here today is in uh, Tangent, Oregon, just south of Albany. Uh, I help our, uh, I should probably say my role with Knife River. I am uh, our contracts risk and governmental affairs manager. I support our exec planning, uh, business development and environmental teams in a variety of uh, uh, operational and legal matters. Um, so at the end of this process, uh, I hope that we as a committee can present OTC with an uh, a durable and adaptive rule structure that embodies, embodies the equity principles and priorities as expressed by the legislature and the affected communities throughout Oregon. Uh, and that ensures smooth operations for all users of the tolled systems um, and addresses the needs of, uh, of Oregon's highway users generally, uh, and including in my area of emphasis, which would be uh, commercial customers and large fleet owners. Great, thank you, Ethan. Uh, next up is Jeff. Good morning, um, I'm Jeff Spiegel. I'm the Vice President of Fleet Services and Operating Tax for Penske Truck Leasing. Um, we are a truck leasing and rental provider uh, in the United States and Canada, uh, and we uh, have offices in just about every single state in the U.S. and most of Canada. We also have a logistics branch where we offer logistic services and have our own drivers. Um, so we touch it from a unique perspective with rental and leasing because we are not the operator of the asset, uh, but we provide the vehicles for use on the roads, and then we are also operators ourselves. Um, I am based out in Reading, Pennsylvania, and uh, as far as the project goes, um, I'm just hoping to see some uh, benefit for large fleet carriers uh, as this process gets rolled out. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Lanny? Yeah, good morning. Uh, I'm Lanny Gower. I'm with XPO Logistics. Uh, we're a nationwide LTL carrier, freight carrier. Uh, I'm based out of Portland, and uh, we have locations throughout Oregon, but we have a large facility out in Clackamas, uh, and our headquarters is downtown Portland for our administrative people. Uh, and I guess I'm hoping to see out of the process the, the most efficient and administratively for both the state and for the users uh, to maximize whatever tools are collected to go into the highways as opposed to administration. Thanks, Lanny. Lauren? Hi, so I am Lauren Poor. I am the uh, Vice President of Government and Legal Affairs for the Oregon Farm Bureau. Um, so the Oregon Farm Bureau is the state's largest agricultural organization. We represent nearly uh, 6,300 farm and ranch families across the state. So we're a statewide organization. Um, I personally live in West Lynn, Oregon, um, but I work um, out of our office in Salem. Uh, so um, at the end of this, um, I hope that um, I can share with the committee um, an advisory committee that the cost of getting our products to market is just one more input that our producers have to consider when determining um, if their farming and ranching operations are going to pencil that year, um, that our producers are price takers, not price setters, um, so they don't get to just increase the cost of their goods to recoup that cost. And um, so I think that that's something that I'd really like to impress upon this committee that um, specifically for the farming and ranching committee, or our, our farming and ranching community, um, they're on the commodities market. So they don't get to just um, increase the cost of their goods to um, make up for the increase of the cost of their inputs. And this is an input that they'll have to consider um, the transportation of getting their goods to market. Thanks, Lauren. Mark? Hi, I'm um, Mark. My full name is Mark Ortega Bastoreche Kilman Burnham, but to be nice to you guys, I just go by Mark Burnham. Um, my role is the Governmental Affairs Director for Global Medical Response, which is one of the parent companies of several ambulance and air ambulance providers in the region. Um, we're nationwide, and so I'm uh, always paying close attention to quick access across the region. Um, 
I live in Clackamas County, but I we have operations all across the state. So I pay attention to that. And then for basically the end project, I really want to make sure that we have a, a fair cost sharing model. We come up with that, those ideas. We address the unique issues in this area, but also that we continue to have timely access to emergency care along these areas where we have tolling. Thanks, Mark. Marie? Yeah, good morning, everybody. My name is Marie Dodds. I'm the Director of Government Affairs and Public Affairs for AAA Oregon, Idaho. We are part of a national federation, obviously AAA. Uh, our territory stretches across both states of Oregon and Idaho. And here in Oregon, uh, we have more than 750,000 members, uh, the vast majority of whom own vehicles. So I do represent those passenger vehicles, the customers, as you put it at the start of our presentation today. Uh, geographic location, we are statewide. I am based in our downtown Portland office. And uh, at the end of this project, I hope that we can ensure that any tolling program is fair, equitable, and transparent, and also complies with the Oregon Constitution, specifically Section 9, Article 3A, regarding revenue from taxes on motor vehicle use and fuel. Thanks, Marie. Uh, next up is Mike. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Mike Card. Can you hear me okay, Jamie? Yeah, you're coming through good. Good. Uh, uh, my name is Mike Card. I'm the owner of Combined Transport. We represent the little dot down in Jackson County. Um, we have 500 trucks that run all the roads in, the, in Oregon and in the U.S. Um, you'll see us uh, running on 205 and I-5 all the time. Um, <clears throat> I am past chairman of the Oregon Trucking Association and the American Trucking Association, so we've had a lot of experience with other state tolling. <clears throat> and what I'd like to see at the end of this project is a little higher uh, elevation view is I'm just looking for the best methods of funding infrastructure in Oregon for all citizens of Oregon. Thanks, Mike. Next up is Omar. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Omar Cruz. I'm the purchasing manager for May Trucking. We're headquartered in Salem. Um, we run all 48 states and all Oregon, obviously. Um, what I really feel like at the end of this project, I hope that everyone understands the impact of the cost in pretty much every industry that's going to get affected and how that's going to transition the cost towards the customer, uh, especially in the trucking industry that we can set our rates, maybe not in the agricultural like uh, uh, Lauren said, but um, we can all see how that affects and how everybody can have an equal voice uh, and make sure that everybody is uh, doing their fair part. Thanks, Omar. Uh, next up is Park. Good morning. Uh, my name is Park Woodworth, and I'm representing Ride Connection, which, along with uh, several social service agencies we work with, provide um, social service and volunteer transportation in the Tri-County area. I live in Washington County. Um, and I also have previous experience with uh, carpooling and van pooling. And I was on the Equity and Mobility Advisory Committee prior, prior to this committee. Uh, my hope is at the end of this process, uh, we can all be comfortably uh, in acceptance of our recommendations. Thanks, Park. Uh, next up is Sean, Sean Philbrook. Thank you for the clarification. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sean Philbrook. I'm the Vice President of Programs for a Business Leaders Group, Identity Park County, based in Vancouver, Washington. So I 
represent uh, Clark County and uh, apparently the state of Washington, according to the dot earlier. Um, so while I was born and raised and work in Vancouver, I recently moved uh, to Beaverton um, and rent an apartment near my wife's work over in Washington County. So I now represent commuters accessing the system between Oregon and Washington on a daily basis, um, also through my work, um, obviously business leaders that operate in Southwest Washington, uh, but also because we are a bi-state region, a number of those employers operate on both sides of the river. So a lot of bi-state efforts in, in that regard. We also have a special project um, called Southwest Washington Freight and Commerce Task Force through my organization. And so, um, so we also represent uh, freight and commerce in, in that regard too. Um, at the end of this process, I'll go high level as well, just to begin until we are able to refine our, our thoughts as a group here, but would just hope for a, a thoughtful and very reasonable outcome uh, that we're able to achieve the goals of this committee um, through the rulemaking process. So thank you. Thank you, Sean. Uh, next up is Shannon. Sorry, I'm on my phone, so it's always hard to find where I unmute. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um, I'm Shannon Knight. Um, I own a site for Sport Eyes, which is a sports eyewear and sunglass store here in Westland. I also am uh, probably representing the minority and women-owned businesses. Um, I uh, hope to get from this process that we have a solution that's livable for the Westland residents and businesses and minimizing the impacts to quiet neighborhoods uh, with diversion and minimize um, the effects it might have on our local small businesses who employees have to now pay a tax to get to work and customers now have to pay a tax to um, just to patronize them. And so um, just worried about those effects and hoping we can get good outcomes for them. Thanks, Shannon. Sharla, you're next. Hi there, thank you, uh, Jamie. So I'm Charlotte Moffat. I'm the Senior Policy Director for Oregon Business and Industry. OBI is uh, Oregon's largest, uh, largest, most comprehensive business association. We represent 1,600 businesses, 80% of which are small businesses. Um, and uh, I work in the policy areas of energy, environment, natural resources, and transportation. Um, and I would say, oh, uh, geographic location. I, I happen to live in Washington County, but um, our office is based in Salem. Um, and I've appreciated a, a lot of the comments about what people would like to see at the end of this process and um, agree of agree with uh, uh, those statements. Um, but I'll just uh, throw in that, um, that at the end of this process, we find solutions to funding critical transportation infrastructure projects that don't disproportionately impact any one user group. So thank you. Thank you, Sharla. Uh, next up is Shatreen. Good morning. My name is Shatreen Craig, and I'm the executive director for the Westland Chamber of Commerce and the Lake Oswego Westland Business Recovery Center. Um, I live in Westland, uh, right by I-205 and all the fun stuff going on. Um, at the end of this project, my hope is that we can share a clear and transparent tolling plan with the customers that we're talking about and that we use a lens of equity. Um, we can share the environmental impacts. We talk about diversion concerns and the financial impact for the small businesses in the community and really have a good conversation with each other and make some, make some valid points and hopefully put out a very, very, very good uh, ruling and advisory for us all. Sorry about that. Thank you, Shatreen. Uh, and, our, and next up is Nafisa. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nafisa Fai. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm a Washington County Commissioner I'm also our transportation commissioner, uh, but my role, uh, this committee is representing uh, sort of the uh, conduit or bridge between this committee and the regional toll advisory committee, which is a group that was brought together to advise the director of ODOT, who also chairs that committee. So I'm really hoping that um, we can bridge the gap or somehow funnel information from this committee 
me and to that committee. So I'll try to keep that up and um, and I recommend everyone if you are able to to just cruise through some of the information from that committee and uh, our charter and all the information that we see. Um, my hope for I think for this committee, just also something I say every other committee or every other conversations around tolling is, you know, I'm really hoping that we come up with an appropriate balance of congestion management and revenue generation. So how do we really balance the two? It's gonna be interesting. Um, and, and then I'm also interested in how do we offer a, sort of a clear part, you know, clear value proposition uh, to our public and uh, figure out that this tolling isn't going to burden our community further as an unintended consequence, but we really look into creating something that will add value to Oregon's transportation system, but also doesn't further burden our community. So that that's my two cents. Thank I'm you, excited to be here. Thank you and welcome. Uh, and our last STRAC member to introduce themselves is Phil. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's really great to be here today. Uh, my name is Phil Wu. Um, I am a Portland-based retired pediatrician from Kaiser Permanente and currently board president of the Oregon Environmental Council. Uh, but my role here today is to represent uh, the Equity, Mobility and Advisory Committee um, and of course, Park uh, was a very significant part of that group as well. So um, I'm sure he will probably bring his perspectives uh, from EMAC as well. But um, um, EMAC, as some of you may know, um, has spent the past couple of years developing a significant set of recommendations around uh, revenue generation and hopefully um, how those funds will be utilized um, and some uh, uh, important you know, issues around accountability. Um, ultimately, our goal, um, and hopefully that will be reflected in the work of this committee, is to make sure that um, our historically marginalized uh, communities um, don't experience um, an undue burden from tolling and congestion management, and at the same time, uh, benefit from uh, tolling and congestion benefit um, in an equitable fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. And we have two uh, STRAC members who couldn't join us today. And so we'll catch up with them um, at our next meeting. So appreciate everybody taking the time to answer those questions and introduce yourself to all of us. Uh, we will have lots of time to get to know each other better through this process. Um, and uh, But with that, I would like to hand it over to Erica and have Erica introduce uh, herself. And uh, we can go ahead and put the slides up for, for you, Erica. Thank you so much. So good morning again, everyone. I've already um, said who I am and what I do here at ODOT. And um, I'm with you today just uh, to provide, well, not just to provide, but to provide some um, diversity, equity, and inclusion training. And I want to apologize in advance if this seems a bit remedial for some of you. Um, however, we want to make sure that as our uh, committees start their work, uh, that we emphasize what diversity, equity, and inclusion means here at ODOT. Um, and if we could go to the next slide, slide, please. So our guiding principles for today are to be kind and respectful. Understand that this space that we are in is a safe space for you to ask questions, um, share comments or thoughts, and um, just and to speak, just raise your hands if you know how to use the Zoom feature uh, to raise your hand or put a comment in the chat um, and I will call on you. And then be aware of the space that you're occupying. Um, if you notice that others aren't having an opportunity to speak or um, we're not giving enough opportunity to everyone, then just let's all just be aware of that. And then participate. Um, I, it's not my goal to talk at you for an hour. However, um, we do have a lot to get through and I am on a, I, got, I have a hard stop at 1030, so I might move a little faster than normal, but I do encourage your participation today. 
Uh, next slide, please. So what I would like for you to learn today uh, is to understand the definitions in the glossary that we're about to go over. Um, a lot of times we uh, have various definitions for a lot of equity related terms. And I wanna make sure that I'm giving you the um, academic definition for these uh, words and terms, and you'll know what they mean as we use them here at ODOT. And then we'll understand what diversity is and that it does exist among us. There's quite a bit of varying diversity um, among the group that, of the STRAC, but I wanna um, highlight that no matter what we look like on the outside, that there's still diversity among us. We want to recognize and understand our privilege um, and how that can show up in spaces where we are advocating for equitable outcomes and practices. We want to understand implicit bias, where our biases come from, and then learn how to mitigate them. Next slide, please. So we'll start with this foundational glossary. And um, I just wanna state, uh, Madeline, I can't see any hands. So if someone has a question, please just interrupt me and let me know. Um, but the first term that we'll talk about is access, which is the ability, right, and permission to approach enter, speak with, or fully use all aspects of the systems, institutions, and the services offered in a society. I heard many of you say that you're on this committee because you wanna make sure that uh, tolling is uh, equitable and that we consider uh, how tolling will impact everyone. We want people to be able to have access to this process. Uh, you all have been granted access into this process to share your thoughts and opinions. Um, an ally is someone who supports a group other than one's own. An ally acknowledges oppression and actively commits to reducing their own compl complicity, investing and in building their own knowledge and awareness. So um, you're, you're building your knowledge and awareness here today by participating in this training, but also you're here to acknowledge um, the systems that are that exist that are around us and how um, others may be impacted by decisions made. Belonging is more than just being seen. It requires having a meaningful voice and the opportunity to participate in the design of social and cultural structures. You all are participating in that by being a member of uh, the STRAC. You, your voices are um, meaningful to us here at ODOT and how we apply tolling across the state. And so we just really um, appreciate that, first of all, and then uh, make sure that your voice is heard so that you feel as though you belong. Being colorblind, the belief that everyone should be treated equally without respect to societal, economic, historical, racial, or other difference. No differences are seen or acknowledged, and a common phrase associated with colorblindness is, I don't see color. Um, I share with people all the time, I'm from Alabama, and um, when I moved to Oregon five years ago, this, that was the first time I had heard, I don't see color. Uh, it's not a common thing that's said in the South. And so um, when you say things like that, it is erasing a large portion of the person's identity just so that you feel comfortable with who they are. And we shouldn't have to do that. Um, we can acknowledge a person's identity and see them for who they are and understand that the, at times there are indeed societal, economic, historical, and other differences. Equity is the fair treatment, access, opportunity, and advancement for all people, while at the same time striving to identify and eliminate barriers that have prevented full participation of some groups. I have a graphic that uh, shows a visual representation of equality, equity, and justice that we'll go over in just a few minutes. But many of you stated in your reason, reason for being a part of the STRAC is to make sure that tolling outcomes are equitable. And so this is what equity means. The next slide, please. Identity. Identity is who you are, the way you think about yourself and the characteristics that define you. 
how we are viewed by the world and our assigned identities that may or may not align with how we see ourselves. Many of us can represent a number of different groups at once, right? I am a Black woman uh, culturally from the South. Um, I represent a number of different groups at just at going through day-to-day -day life. We all do. And so understanding our identity is important and respecting each other's identity is critically important. Inclusion is the act of creating environments in which any individual or group can be and feel welcomed, respected, supported, and valued as a fully participating member. We hope that you all, as you start this process of rulemaking for tolling, I hope that you all feel included um, and that your voices are heard and that you feel welcomed and respected. Oppression is social power privilege and prejudice systems that create multi-layered inequities sustained and reinforced through actions, laws, policies, and processes. So um, when we talk more, uh, when I show you the graphic that illustrates equality, equity, and justice, I can um, better illustrate oppression as well as systemic and structural racism. Other ring. Um, the dynamics, processes, and structures that produce marginality and lasting inequality across human identities of religion, sex, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, language spoken, ability, sexual orientation, and skin tone, lumping people into groups based on what ever aspect we think we know about them um, is othering. We, we think in some way that they are different from us, so they have to be a part of this other group. Um, systemic institutional and structural racism is a form of racism that is expressed in social and political systems. It can lead to issues of discrimination in criminal justice, employment, housing, health care, and political power. And then unlearning and relearning. Um, this is what I hope some of this happens today is the process of continually analyzing, evaluating, and challenging knowledge as a process to increase proficiency, innovation, and belonging. So as we go through these slides today and we talk about these various topics, hopefully um, you might rethink about something that um, you may have thought or believed and then relearn something new. Are there any questions about these uh, terms before I move on? And again, I can't see anybody. Okay, thank you. Next slide. So this is the graphic that I was referencing. Um, as we see, and this is a common graphic that's used um, to illustrate equality, equity, and justice. Um, so we see that we have three people here that are trying to view a soccer game. Um, they are of varying heights, and then there's a uh, fence, a wooden fence in the way of their view. So for some of them. So the assumption with equality is that everyone benefits from the same supports. So even the person that is the tallest there receives support and they didn't need it because they can see over the fence without it, um, but they received it anyway. That's what equality does. Now you notice that equality actually helps the person that is in the middle um, because now they can see over the fence with the supports that equality provided. However, um, the shorter person there cannot see over the fence um, and equality didn't help them at all. So with equity, everyone gets the supports that they need. This is the concept of affirmative action when it's used correctly and thus produces equity. Those that need um, a different amount of supports receive them. Um, and then those that don't need them don't receive them. Now, when I've done this before, someone asked, why are we taking 
um, supports from the taller person, the tallest person and giving them to someone else. That's not how equity works. Equity is not like pie, wherein if my slice of the pie is larger than your slice of the pie is smaller. Um, it's more that these resources or supports will be available anyway. And the person, the people that need the most receive the most. That's what equity is. Um, and then justice is just removing the barrier. All three people can see the game without supports or accommodations because the cause of the inequity has been addressed. The systemic barrier has been removed. Now, when we think about systems and sy systemic barriers, let's think of back to when the uh, Constitution was written, and we know who was in the room at the time, wealthy landowning um, white men. Um, and at the time that the Constitution was written, uh, people of color and women were in a different status in society. But however, however, those systems, systems that we have today, healthcare, education, those systems, uh, the criminal justice system, those systems were built um, with a certain structure in mind because not everyone was at the same place in society at the time. As we have evolved as a people, uh, as a society, um, now people of color have access and rights. Women have access and rights. Um, our systems haven't come along in this, at the same rate. So now we see different systems impacting different people in a different way. Um, I come from a higher ed background and I always pick on education as we talk about um, a system that has barriers in place. And when we think about the cost of higher education, that is certainly a barrier for some and it keeps people out. If we think about the different circumstances in life that impact people, um, some students are place bound, meaning that they can't move to a different uh, city or state to go to college. Um, so they may they need access where they are. So um, those are just some brief examples. And then the requirements to get into college, um, a certain GPA, a certain um, ACT or SAT test score, if the college requires that, those things are additional barriers because it takes money um, to be able to do well on the ACT, SAT or graduate um, entrance exams. And you have to study by prep materials, those things. And if you don't have access to be able to do that, then you're at a disadvantage and that barrier is impacting access. Any questions? Okay, next slide. So I didn't define diversity in the terms because I wanted to talk about it here. So what do we mean when we say diversity? We're really referring to two main sets of characteristics, those surface level demographic characteristics and then deeper level characteristics. For those surface level characteristics, those things that we can see or make assumptions about, uh, about people, gender, race, ethnicity, age, national origin, and so on, um, we have to acknowledge that those surface level characteristics can cause people to have different experiences as they go through life as a member of certain groups. Um, and then deeper level characteristics are personality traits, values, things that people are passionate about. Uh, normally, when I've done this exercise before, I start by asking people what they're passionate about. And I live in Central Oregon where a lot of people are passionate about the outdoors and nature. But when you start making decisions based on those things that you're passionate about, what you'll see is that you end up with a group of people that are just like you. So we have to make sure that we are being inclusive of all thoughts all opinions, even if values and personality traits and things that people are passionate about are different. Next slide, please. And this is just a visualization of um, how much we miss when we make assumptions about people just based on the things that we see above the surface, like skin color, gender, race, and age. 
all the things below the waterline are not visible to us. And we might have more in common with people than we think if we just dig a little deeper, right? But if we make assumptions uh, based on those surface level characteristics, we are missing so much that brings diversity to the table. Next slide, thank you. So when we talk about privilege, um, sometimes people, this, you know, it, privilege can be a trigger word for some people because, and I wanna just say privilege, having it, doesn't mean you did not work hard to get to where you are. There are two different types of privilege. And privilege has been studied uh, since the 80s. It's not a new concept. But Peggy McIntosh wrote like the groundbreaking article surrounding privilege, and it's called Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. And so when we think about um she defines privilege as an invisible package of unearned assets, which one can count on cashing in each and every day, but about which one is largely oblivious. So the privileges or the privilege that some people have that's unearned, they usually aren't aware that they have it. Um, they don't know how it might impact them every day. And then earned privilege is a privilege or advantage gained by one's own effort, social position, or concession. For example, I have privilege, but I earned it by going to college, getting degrees, which allows me to make a certain amount of money, which allows me to live in a certain neighborhood, and so on and so on. I have earned the ability to be able to um, impact my social position. Um, therefore, it impacts that of my children and, and so on and so forth. However, let's think about some of those unearned privileges um, that exist. If these statements apply to you, then you certainly have a uh, privilege. I can, if I wish, arrange to be in the company of people of my race most of the time. So as I said, I live in Central Oregon right now, and I can go weeks without seeing anyone that looks like me in bins. Um, I live with, my, you know, thankfully my two kids live with me. I see them every day. But outside of my household, I don't, um, I don't see a lot of people like me. I have to be very intentional with um, getting together with friends if it's necessary for me to be around people that look exactly like me. Um, I can be pretty sure that my neighbors in a new location will be neutral or pleasant to me on the day that I move in. I can go shopping alone most of the time, pretty well assured that I will not be followed or harassed by store employees or other customers. I can go into a supermarket and find the staple foods which fit my cultural traditions. I know people that live in Central Oregon that drive to Portland to go to uh, ethnic grocery stores that sell, you know, food that they cook that's a part of their cultural traditions. Um, and when we think about the three hour drive from Bend to Portland, that's, you know, that's quite a stretch. I can easily find a barber or a stylist to style my hair where I live. I'm very fortunate that I have someone in Bend that can do my hair, but um, it took a while to find them um, because many of the stylists in the area didn't cater to my hair type. Um, and I know some other people that drive to Portland for that service as well. I can choose makeup or bandages in flesh color and have them more or less match my skin tone. And these are common things that we don't think about on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, if you think about going into the grocery store and going down the hair care, uh, skin care aisle, there are tons of products available for uh, the majority of the population and then a smaller um, section of products for other people. Uh, I live, you know, since I get most of my stuff like that from Amazon. Um, just because there's just not a wide variety of places to shop um, for hair care products for me in, in Central Oregon. Any questions regarding privilege? Okay. 
Next slide. So when we think about bias and, and implicit bias, um, our implicit, what is implicit bias? It refers to the attributes that we quickly assign to people based on their social categories, those surface level um, things that we see and make assumptions about. Um, we make assumptions about what people are like and that they may be different from us in some way. We tend to hold implicit biases that favor our own in-group. Uh, social identity theory tells us that the, part, the portion of a person's self-concept is derived from per perceived membership to a relevant social group. Uh, how I feel about myself can come from what social group I belong to. Um, in-group favoritism is the pattern of favoring members of one's own in-group over out-group members. If you think about uh, just the natural behavior of people and walking into a crowded room where you know uh, very few people, we look around, you know, to see who we might connect with. And most of the time we choose some sort of uh, demographic characteristic that we can see and connect with and we go to, th to that group. Uh, it's just natural human behavior. Everyone has biases, even people with commitments to being impartial. And those people are judges, police officers, educators. You know, there are a number of professions where people are committed to being impartial. Biases themselves don't make you a bad person. We all have them. Our brains can only process so much of the information that's coming at us. So if we think about walking down a busy sidewalk um, populated with a lot of people and we just see people we and put them in a box in our minds, right? We don't have time in our day to stop, talk to every person we see to make sure that we're putting them in the right box. Um, our brains do that to help protect us by automatically filtering information that seems familiar. But there are times that we could be wrong. Um, but again, we just don't have the time going about our day to talk to people um, and get that much information. But the problem comes about when we allow our biases to impact how we see people and as a result, how we interact with people. For example, we can see someone, someone might walk past me um, on a sidewalk and think, OK, Black woman, check, put me in that box. But when you start applying other attributes like, um, you know, she she may not be um, educated or she may be, I wonder if she's a criminal, you know, <laughs> assigning all those other negative traits, that's a problem. And that's when our biases are causing us to act in a way that is not appropriate, making judgments about people based on those surface level um, characteristics. Next slide. So where do our biases come from? Um, usually from experiences or influences that we've had in life. We've all had, uh, most people have had parental influence and we all have childhood experiences that could cause, our, uh, cause us to lump people into certain groups. We are constantly bombarded with stereotypes in the media. And some um, lighthearted examples are women are bad drivers. Men don't ask for directions. Older people don't know how to use technology. Smart girls aren't pretty. And for my engineering friends here at ODOT, I have this one about engineers or scientists are bad at socializing. All of those things are stereotypes. You may know one or two people that fall into the category, um, but that doesn't mean it applies to everybody. So we really need to avoid those broad generalizations. And then we have knowledge of real world disparities between groups. We know um, how health disparities may impact some groups of people and how income disparities impact some groups. But again, it's not everybody that's a member of a certain group that is experiencing that. So we need to make sure that we, we don't just lump people together and believe a thing about an entire group of people because we know one person or had one experience. Next slide. So how do we go about changing 
um, the biases that we believe or the stereotypes that we may believe. Um, we can change them by uh, improving the categories that our minds put people in, causing ourselves to think broader than those boxes. It takes time and effort as our stage of moral development influences how we make decisions. Most people reason at the conventional level. Keep this in mind as I go through these. Most people reason at level two, which is the conventional level, and are looking outside themselves for guidance. So at level one, the pre-conventional level, I'd like you to think about a toddler. So toddlers, children learn early um, what makes their parents smile or laugh and what makes them hear the words stop. No, don't do that, right? That's obedience and punishment orientation. Um, and then a child grows to school age or they start going to uh, daycare and they learn that instrumental purpose um, is a part of their lives. Other adults expect a certain behavior from them. That is instrumental purpose. Other people that might have influence over a child's life. And then they exchange behaviors with other children. This is when your perfect little angels go off to school and come home with behavior that you're not accustomed to. That's that exchange. And then obedience and punishment starts over again as they try out and test out those new behaviors and find out what's, um, what's acceptable and what's not. At level two, um, the conventional level, let's say this is about when we reach age 18 or so, um, interpersonal accord, conformity, and mutual expectations. So as a society here in the United States, we have certain expectations of what an adult should do um, and what an adult should be or strive for, right? Um, Nowadays, my I have a 17-year-old son, and if you all were to meet him, you might want to you might wonder, what are you going to do after high school? And if he says something different from going to college, then that might bring about more questions because the mutual expectation in society is that most kids, when they graduate high school, will go on to college. Well, back when my parents uh, were graduating high school, the options were different. The mutual expectation was different. It was either go to the military or get a job. Those were the options that were available. And my mom chose to get a job. My dad went to the military. Uh, they didn't meet until later in life, but that was uh, that's what they did. And those they followed those mutual expectations. Um, system maintenance is upholding duties and laws. So we have a set of laws that um, guides, guide us here in society. And of course, we have outliers, those that uh, break the law. But there is also a system um, that addresses that behavior. So it keeps everyone within the bounds that whoever has created uh, for a society. But when we reach level three, the post-conventional or principle level is when we start challenging those norms, challenging those mutual expectations. That's how we have um, 17, 18 year olds deciding, you know, I'm going to take a gap year. I'm going to travel or backpack or do things that I want to do before uh, starting the college experience, or I just don't want to go to college. We still have people that are going to the military and making other decisions, challenging those mutual expectations. And then we start learning at level three about social contracts and individual rights and how some groups don't have the same social contracts and individual rights as others, which causes people like me to go into the fields that we are in to challenge those, um, those mutual expectations and conformity that we expect from people as a society. Next slide. Okay, so if we could turn off the slide deck so I can see faces. All right, so what questions, if any, do you have for me? I know I threw a lot at you very fast. I think that's the quickest I've ever went through that material. <laughs> but um, please, ask away. And, and Erica and everybody, we have 20 minutes to engage in conversation with Erica. Um, and so I just I wanted to make sure that folks knew that we had plenty of time to have a discussion.
So I'll pose a question. The fact that none of you have questions can mean one of two or three things. Either this information is not new to you, so, you know, it was like a review. Um, <clears throat> or it could be that maybe it's a group scenario. You're not comfortable asking questions in a group. And if that's the case, please direct your questions to Garrett or Jamie and they will get them to me and I'd be happy to answer them. Um, or three, you're not paying attention. And I wanted everybody to pay attention today. <laughs> so Sharla, do you have a question? You're on mute. I have way too many buttons to um, to click here. Um, I, I just want to thank you for the presentation, Erica. And, um, you know, I think it's, um, you know, awareness has been raised to a very significant degree. I still think it's really important information to um, walk through. And so I appreciate that. And um, just a, a, a personal um Short personal story. Um, a few years ago, um, I <clears throat> had posted on Facebook about uh, kind of understanding white privilege and checking white privilege kind of thing, and I got so many so many comments um, that well, you're not a privileged person. You've worked hard. Well, privilege and white privilege are different things. Very different things. And um, so I just think uh, you know bringing an understanding of um, kind of, uh, you know, being open to the idea that we don't know what we don't know sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so um, anyway, I just, uh, I just appreciate the the conversation. And I think it's an important um, topic to discuss as we go into this tolling um, rock process. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Wu. Yes, uh, I, I, I don't really have a question, I don't think, but just a, a comment, and that is that um, I, I found that uh, slide, the last slide that you um, presented on the uh, what cognitive moral development to be really fascinating. And I think for me, what, what struck me about that was the, the conventional, that, that level two, the conventional mm -hmm. thing, and, and those mutual expectations, to me, that's where all of the stereotypes and you know everything that you had described up to that point um, sort of shape uh, mutual expectations. And then those get embedded in ourselves over time right. uh, to the point where we are actually um, stereotyping ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that becomes to me kind of a really insidious uh, insidious process because it's kind of a form of internal oppression. That's right. That's right. You know, I have a a, a personal a, a personal experience because when I started uh, at OSU Cascades in Bend, I was the only black faculty member there, only black employee at at that location, um, and it's not like there are a ton of Black people at OSU. At the time that I was there, it was like 89 um, Black faculty and staff out of uh, about 6,000 um, employees. And so small number of people. And when my, um, my work started getting recognized, um, you know, every time I did anything, they would put my face on social media. They would, you know, uh, anytime anything involving race happened, the local news would come and talk to me. And I put pressure on myself to fit into this mold of what a professional Black woman should look like, act like, and sound like. And so that pressure, self-imposed pressure, right? No one was putting that on me, but that self-imposed pressure can be just as heavy as those societal pressures are. Um, I love being at ODOT because no one cares who I am or what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> people do care, but not at that. No same one cares level. who Garrett is. Yeah, <laughs> not at yeah. that same level. So um, I can blend in a lot easier. And when I was at OSU, I would travel back home so often just to get a break from being the only. Right. Well, and it, so it, it does happen. 
Well, you know, and, and, and to me, what it says is that there are narratives yes. that, that we have all constructed about, you know, groups and people and communities, and those narratives get really entrenched. Mm-hmm. And I think the real challenge is how do you change a narrative? That's right. I and mean, how do you rewrite a narrative so that things can move forward? Anyway, I'll stop talking. Thanks. Thank you. You know, as you all go forward and do this important work, um, when you consider the impacts of tolling, um, think broadly, right? Don't just think, oh, it's just this group or that group. You know, think broadly about the impacts and benefits, you know, Um, because diversity means something that's a lot broader than what we than most people think I do not want to mispronounce your name <laughs> it's okay Nafisa okay all right I, it, it look it looks intimidating but it's very fanatic actually if you think about it now okay. okay. but anyways I know it looks very intimidating but <laughs> don't worry about it Erica Great presentation. I really appreciate it, Uh, Dr. Wu. I think, you know, I just wanted to add something that really validates what you said, Dr. Wu, around um, the narrative and challenging those narratives. For my own story, um, I when I ran for Washington County Commission role, um, our county is over 100 years old and We've never had uh, diversity at this level. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I'm very diverse, in case you can't tell, uh, of all levels. Uh, and it was very, everybody was asking, why are you trying to do the impossible? Um, or why are you trying to be the, the impossible first? Because a county that's 100 years old, uh, usually the narrative was, you know, you have to be a man um, or a, and a white man and sort of uh, a Republican because that's been the history that has been set. Not that there's anything wrong if you are any of that, but that was the narrative and people to uh, see myself and run for that. But for me, I knew that win or loss was not guaranteed. I just wanted to challenge the narrative that as a county that was a number one diverse county in Oregon, just to show that this community that you can challenge that narrative. And if you don't, if you're not successful the first time, the next time, you know, you can craft and find that path and eventually have that diversity. Uh, Luckily, the community came, uh, you know, got behind me and really pushed to demand and demonstrate representation on our board. But it was really sort of focused on that. So I think the more we challenge the narratives that has been set forth, I think the more we'll have successful and we'll have diversity everywhere instead of being the only person and the one person that's, you know, it's hard being the one person. Uh, I, I can validate that. Uh, as the first Black, first Muslim person to be elected in Washington County and and the first sort of person of color for a county that old. So it's hard, um, but also that I know that I'm not the only one doing, you know, like all of you are here today because you, we all care about. I was watching this presentation and many of us were nodding and really resonating. So I'm really glad that, you know, and, I appreciate the ancestors that we sit on their shoulders and what they had to put up, but I'm really glad everyone who's fighting this fight because I was elected because of all you who believe in this work. Congratulations and thank you for challenging the status quo. All it takes is one person and you had the courage to do that. Any other thoughts, questions, or comments? Hey, Erica, I yes. have one. Okay. Just to, um, you know, as we were planning the session together with the project team, you know, we all talked about the importance of bringing um, 
bringing your presentation forward. Can you just share a little bit with the group about the opportunity that we have in creating a new system, you know, working with a DEI lens intention intentionally? Yeah. Um, sorry, the lights just went off in my office and I have to, it'll be okay. Uh, <laughs> I think that um, ODOT acknowledges the harm that we've caused in the past by not considering all groups um, when we make decisions. And I think it is important to have discussions like this to show that we are intentional in the work that we are doing now to move forward in a very different way. And you all are a part of that. Um, and I am available, you know, to come back anytime um, to talk about anything that um, might be impacting decision making. But uh, we take this very seriously. You know, equity is not just something that we throw on our branding and say, um, you know, this is the new thing or this is the buzzword. We take it seriously. And ODOT has invested um, in my in my position and my team uh, and everyone here um, is invested in making uh, ODOT different in, in regard to how we impact the communities that we serve. So we just, you know, I just feel that, um, A, I'm grateful that Travis thought this was important to put into this, into this uh, introduction for you all today uh, to show you that uh, this value is serious uh, and we take it seriously here. So I hope that answered your question, Jamie. Yeah, thank you. Because I know we had a really thoughtful conversation with you about you know, how long and about what topics to bring forward and why. And um, nice. and so, you know, that was a, a really valuable precursor to the information you shared today. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to connect that uh, with all the members here. Charlotte? Yes, so in the, in the spirit of the discussion, I just wanted to mention that um, I do think it's um, really helpful to the overall group if there are things that come up that you know uh, are you know implicit bias or or explicit bias that um, you know that we can engage in a conversation that somebody says points it out in a you know in a neutral way and says you know it addresses it. Um, and we can sort of have a conversation about that rather than I think that sometimes um, it it might be a little intimidating to um, you know ra raise those raise those issues and just have a conversation. So I just appreciate the ability to um, you know ad address that as those things happen rather than kind of either letting them fester or having a you know kind of confrontational you know something confrontational or something. I don't know just. Does that make sense? <laughs> it makes perfect sense. Yes. So, um, you know, and so, sometimes people don't really don't know what they don't know. And so, um, right. so they just, it needs to be just addressed in the moment um, in a, you know, in a neutral and respectful way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if there's nothing else, I, I want to thank all of you for your participation with the STRAC. We appreciate your service to ODOT. And um, thank you for giving me this time and your attention today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Erica. So um, we are scheduled to take a break. And we had squeezed in a five minute break. and. Thanks to Erica and all of you, you all get a 10 minute break. And so we're gonna come back together at 1030 and we're gonna start our 1030 time with an interactive poll. And we've got a couple of um, polls that we're gonna do uh, in, the, in the next you know, couple of hours. Um, so you can look forward to that. The next session is uh, 80 minutes of a lot of presentation. We will make some pauses for, for questions, but it's a lot of information at you. So use your 10 minute break to fill your coffee cup and get in a comfy chair and get situated um, so we can uh, aim that fire hose at you like Travis said. So uh, let's go ahead and take a 
a 10 minute, you know, let's come back at 1030. Garrett, I just want to check with you. I'm making a few adjustments on the fly. Make sure you're cool with that. Yeah, we're all good. Okay. Yep. All right. So let's come back at 1030 and be ready to receive a lot of information.
Hi folks, we'll be starting our meeting again in a minute. I'm gonna give people a chance to come back. Welcome back. Welcome back to our live stream viewers. Hopefully you took a break as well. Madeline, let's go ahead and start off the next section with our, our little poll. So um, this is a tool some of you might be familiar with. Uh, we use this a fair amount in our meetings as a way to get real-time information from folks. Um, and to have a way for you to engage with us in a little bit different way. It's, it's pretty fun. And, uh, and so it's called a menti, a menti poll. And the way it works is that you just on your cell phone or you know open a new tab on your computer, um, you just type in menti.com. And in the chat, you'll see in the chat, uh, Madeline just put a code. And you just type that code. And in the chat is the link to menti.com too. You can just click on that link. It takes you right there. There'll be a screen like you see on the slide here. It asks for a code. You put in this number and, and it just takes you to a, a simple question and you just answer that question. And in real time, uh, we'll have a slide that we can see people's answers. And the question that uh, we're asking folks before we start off our 80 minute segment of presentation to all of you, is your years that you've been engaged in a tolling conversation, um, tracking tolling, participating in meetings. Um, you know, we wanna get a sense of from the group sort of where everybody's at in terms of level of expertise. And that will really help in real time for our presenters to be like, oh, okay, well, we should spend a little more time here or we can spend, you know, or we can maybe move quickly through this. Um, so yeah, so people are getting the hang of it. So we've got uh, 16, uh, members. Yep, so we've got 13 participants here so far. And you could just see it's, you know, pretty simple. It's a, it's a nice little tool um, for us to use and we'll use it at different points uh, in the meeting today and we'll use it in future meetings as well. So we can just gauge in real time kind of where folks are at. So it looks like we've got uh, one relative expert with more than five years. <laughs> and a number of people on the uh, zero to five. So that's, you know, that's still a fair amount of, you know, there's about half the group has more limited experience and uh, about half the group has some real working knowledge and one has been with it for quite a long time. So thank you for that. So for our presenters, um, just take that into account as you're thinking about the uh, areas to emphasize or uh, things that you need to want to move a little bit more quickly around. So the next segment is an introduction to Oregon tolling. And when we met with everybody in their individual um, interviews, people had really said that, you know, it's, it'd be helpful to just remind us again why we're doing this. <laughs> remind us again, where did this decision come from? And so that's, uh, that's Travis. Um, Travis can talk about how we got here, and uh, what are the goals and the benefits and challenges. So Travis, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thanks, Jamie. So I'm going to cover a few slides and uh, you see a picture of Maureen Bach there. Unfortunately, she's not able to be here today. She wasn't feeling very well. So I'm gonna cover her portion as well. So next slide, please. So, Tolling, how did we get here? Why are we doing this? I'll give you a little bit of context about both the legislative uh, direction that ODOT has received, as well as some of the, the funding and uh, financial issues and, and the challenges we're dealing with on the transportation system that are leading us to tolling. So uh, this has been a long process uh, that we have been going through. You know, Back in 2015, 2016, the governor and also uh, a legislative committee led a process uh, of developing a vision for Oregon's transportation system uh, that took a tour all around the state. In fact, there were two tours, one by the governor's transportation vision panel, one by 
uh, a legislative committee that was set up subsequent to that. They went all around the state, and I think some of you may have participated in that. I think, I think Mike uh, Card, you were a part of a, a visit to the uh, Rogue Valley uh, in the past. And what they heard all across the state was about how Oregon's transportation system was starting to suffer from severe congestion, uh, primarily in urban areas and, and even more particularly in the Portland metro region. So when the legislature got together in 2017 to develop a transportation funding and policy package, they uh, identified a number of projects uh, that they wanted ODOT to complete on the state highway system to address major bottlenecks. And they gave direction uh, for us to study and implement congestion pricing uh, on the I-5 and I-205 corridors. Uh, subsequent to that, in 2021, they passed a bill that provided us a little bit of flexibility. Uh, in HB 2017, there was $30 million set aside for uh, the Rose Quarter project, and they provided some flexibility uh, as a financing tool to be able to deliver the core projects in the urban mobility strategy using those resources uh, and gave us some additional direction around pursuing congestion pricing, including uh, how to approach that from an equity standpoint uh, for low-income Oregonians. So there's some existing statute as well. I think uh, it was uh, Marie mentioned uh, Article 9, Section 3A of the Oregon Constitution, which says that basically all uses from the ownership, or sorry, all revenues from the ownership uh, operation or use of a motor vehicle goes into the state highway fund. So any revenues from tolls will be subject to that constitutional restriction uh, and will be used for highway purposes. But that's a little bit more broad than just the, the roadway. There's also some existing statute in Oregon revised statute uh, section, or sorry, chapter 383, that gives the Transportation Commission the role of being the state's toll authority uh, that both sets uh, where we will toll uh, on the state highway system and uh, how that revenue will be used and what the rates will be. So you'll basically, the work of the STRAC is to help uh, as the OTC is developing the administrative rules and then setting the rates for tolling to really help them with that process. Next slide, please. There are a lot of challenges that we are facing in the transportation system statewide, and uh, many of these are multiplied to an exponential level in the Portland metro region where we are initially uh, looking at starting the tolling process. So we know we have significant congestion that in fact affects freight and passenger vehicles. We've got crashes that are causing a unfortunately really high level of uh, death and serious injuries, uh, and it's been going up in recent years. We have aging infrastructure. Most of our bridges, the majority of our bridges were built before 1970. And so they're reaching the end of their normal lifespan. Tied to that, they were, they were built before a day uh, of seismic standards. So we have earthquake risk. We have gaps in multimodal transportation that, that make it hard for people to get around without a car, either on bike or on foot uh, or using public transportation. We have a lot of inequities in access, even to the services that we do have, uh, where particularly, uh, Oregonians who experience low income and, and uh, BIPOC, uh, you know, people of color, uh, have much more difficulty accessing the services that we do have due to geographic disparities, income dis disparities, and other issues. And we know we are seeing a change in climate, and we need to be able to deal with the effects and work to mitigate uh, the greenhouse gas emissions. The challenge, of course, is we have all these challenges, and we don't have anywhere near the resources uh, to be able to tackle them effectively and really give Oregonians the transportation system that they want and need to make their communities good places to live. So that is, uh, from a financial standpoint, one of the reasons why we are looking at tolling to address some of these major transportation infrastructure challenges. Next slide, please. There are a number of benefits to tolling. So we believe that we've seen across the country uh, that tolling, when compared with time of day pricing, uh, can help make better trips for people, improves travel time and reliability, uh, because not only are there fewer vehicles on the road at rush hour typically, but also the road throughput actually is increased uh, because we have smoother traffic flow and can keep cars moving. Uh, it also provides more revenue to fund some of the projects that we need to, to invest in to improve traffic flow in the region, whether that's I-205 uh, improvements or the Rose Quarter, the Interstate Bridge, Boone Bridge, other projects across the state that are really important here. And I would note, really, as we look at, at the cost of these projects and the significant benefits they provide, 
tolling is really the only way that we're going to be able to fund a lot of these projects. So that's why it's really critical. It's the only way we can provide Oregonians the transportation system that they want and need. We also see that by keeping traffic flowing and uh, by managing uh, congestion, we're able to help air quality. Uh, a lot of idling and congestion uh, will be rectified and will, will reduce the emissions that come from that. And there's also some benefit in terms of uh, minimizing the vehicle miles traveled, uh, particularly for passenger vehicles. And we believe that with a tolling system and combined with other supportive policies, investments, we can support transportation equity uh, and make sure that everyone has mobility options to get around. Next slide, please. So that's the high level of you know, how we got here, uh, what we're doing, you know, both the, the legislative direction that, that uh, told ODOT to toll six years ago, as well as uh, the financial and transportation system realities that are, are pushing us uh, to look at tolling. In terms of what we're really looking at, uh, we have a toll program that is designed to manage congestion and sustainably raise revenue for multimodal investments. And right now, the Oregon Toll Program consists of two toll projects, the I-205 toll project and the Regional Mobility Pricing uh, Project. So you can see that uh, there are two bridges on I-205 there that are shown in orange. Uh, the bridges over the Tualatin River, uh, River, sorry, over the Tualatin River and the Abernathy Bridge over the Willamette River. That would be the initial subject of tolling. Uh, right now, our schedule shows us getting there at the end of 2024. And then we would follow that uh, within a year or so uh, with tolling on I-5 and I-205 uh, under the Regional Mobility Pricing Program. You can also see there at the top of the map, uh, the Interstate Bridge Replacement Program, which is looking to uh, replace the 100-year-old structure over the Columbia River with a modern, seismically sound, multimodal bridge uh, that will provide much better uh, seismic resilience and uh, ability for people to get across uh, by all modes of transportation. And that also is something that we're looking to toll uh, in coordination with Washington. And so that will be uh, a bi-state project, but that is a bi-state project, and the tolling will be set by the Transportation Commissions jointly. So it's gonna be a little bit of a different beast as we work through this whole program. Next slide, please. One of the things that we've emphasized to folks, you, you would not be you would, you'd be amazed at the number of people who say, well, why are you going to put toll booths on the, the interstate? That's just going to slow everything down. We are not going to put toll booths on the interstate. That is the last thing we or anyone want to do, because that's really a, a 20th century solution. Instead, we are looking at all electronic tolls that allow people to pay their tolls uh, at highway speed as they drive by. So all lanes are going to be priced. Uh, in some other areas, you've seen express lanes go in, but in Oregon, we really don't have enough lanes. You know, most of our, our freeways are three lanes. Can't really take one of those lanes for an express toll lane. Uh, so we're going to be pricing all lanes. The system will be all electronic, with no toll booths, no stopping, no slowing down. You'd have a transponder in your car. You can actually see a picture of that uh, on the left side there behind the mirror. That's a toll tag that's used in the gorge. Uh, on the uh, Bridge of the Gods and the Hood River Bridge. It's about the size of a band-aid. They're really small. So people can sign up and get an account uh, and get a toll tag. And then that can be read by the transponder, or that transponder can be read uh, by the gantry as they drive by. Uh, if you don't want a transponder in your car, cameras capture your license plate and send you a bill, which then you can pay online. And what we really hope for is to have a very strong customer experience out of this to make it seamless and easy for customers. You know, I've paid the toll in Washington State uh, on the I-405 uh, express toll lanes, and it is a really easy system. You, you go under, you get a bill in the mail based on it reading your license plate, uh, and then you can go online on an iPhone or another system and pay really easily. But we'll also be working to make sure that uh, people who have limited access to cash or banking uh, or uh, have the ability to pay in other ways uh, to make sure that everybody is able uh, to pay a toll uh, seamlessly. So with that, I will turn it over to Eric Havig, who will be talking to you a little bit about some of the toll policy that the Oregon Transportation Commission has established that really set sort of a foundation for your work and some of the sideboards uh, that your work will need to fit within. Eric, take her away. Hey, Travis, um, Mike Card has his hand up. Can you ask a quick question of you? Absolutely. 
Mike, go ahead. Oh. Uh, hey, Tra Travis, thank you. Uh, great uh, presentation. Could you go back on a slide to the benefits of tolling for just a second, please? Yes. I just want to point out a couple of things that I think we as a committee need to think about. Um, back to the benefits of tolling. Yeah, can you, I think it's back two more slides. Somebody. Yep. Okay. Um, totally agree that uh, one of our goals got to be improved travel time and reliability. Air quality is, to, is, is really bad when we have congestion. Um, but tolling does not improve travel time. And tolling does not help air quality. Tolling, if it reduces congestion, then we then it reduces travel time and helps air quality. Um, and I also don't think tolling supports transportation equity either. Um, so well, the first point is, I'm not I'm not saying tolling is bad. I'm just saying that. We, if we're going to say it improves travel and reliability, we have to have another step in this benefit uh, line is if tolling reduces congestion, then it improves travel time and health air quality. If all we're doing is tolling people and um, getting money for the for other improvements, which tolling will definitely bring in revenue, um, then we, we can't really say those other things are going to be a benefit of tolling. And one thing about transportation equity, I, I want to make sure everybody in this committee is thinking about tolling is a very regressive toll. It hurts the poorer people because they can't afford to do tolling. Um, and also, uh, if there's uh, if, if people don't want to pay the tolls and they drive around the tolling, uh, there has been studies that say some toll. Uh, may uh, create more safety issues for the local community and more congestion. So there's just some things that we need to make sure that we're not throwing out blanket statements about tolling's benefits. Yep. That's what I'm Mike, you appreciate the the nuance and the clarification there. And you know, as I noted earlier, we're trying to keep this at the very high level. So I think it's probably best to say that you know tolling can have these benefits. And that this is the way we're working to, to design the system. These are the outcomes we're trying to achieve. And we believe based on you know, what others have done that you can achieve these benefits if you design the system appropriately. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why we want all of you around the table uh, is to help us figure out how we can implement tolling in a way that supports all of these areas. Great, thank you for listening. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Travis. So Travis, uh, we're handing it off to Eric. Yes. Great, thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and advance to the first slide with the policy. There we go. Uh, so again, for, for the STRAC members, uh, my name is Eric Havig. I'm again, the statewide policy and planning manager for ODOT. So uh, dealing with the long range policy work for the state is uh, one of the things I really deal with. So I know some of the STRAC members are very uh, familiar with statewide policy, transportation policy. Others may not be as familiar. So I'll try to kind of hit the, the middle ground here a little bit. But the Oregon Highway Plan is really the statewide policy for all of the highways and roadway networks here in the state of Oregon. It's not just for ODOT. It is also for our local governments and others to set out the vision for the highway network, the roadway network for moving goods and people through the state. It does need to reflect the Oregon Transportation Plan. So we have a higher order plan called the Oregon Transportation Plan, often referred to as our umbrella, setting out high level goals, objectives, and outcomes that we want from all of our transportation systems and investments. And then the highway plan starts to focus those things specifically on the highway and roadway network. Again, it is a high level plan. It doesn't make the decisions, but it sets out the framework of how to make decisions and how to invest and what kind of outcomes do we want to have from our transportation system, specifically the highway system. So it sets those policies, actions, defines the system, classification, what are we trying to achieve around performance and target and preserving the system, operating the system. 
And we've really had this plan in place since 1999. We've made a lot of amendments and updates through that time. So it hasn't stayed static. And one of the specific areas is around tolling. Uh, so Travis gave a little overview of how we got here more recently, but ODOT actually has embarked into the tolling world pre-2017 or House Bill 2017 work. And we have had tolling policies as part of the Oregon Highway Plan since 2012, really in response to a couple of other projects that came out of the OTIA program um, back in the early 2000s. But what we really determined as we we're moving into the more modern ideas of around tolling, congestion pricing, we needed to update and modify our tolling policies. And that's what was recently adopted by our Transportation Commission just earlier this month. So next slide, please. So the amendments that were just adopted by the commission, really we needed to update the terms around roadway pricing. So tolling um, is a form of roadway pricing, congestion pricing is another form. So trying to be more clear about those terms, what are we trying to do and how do they relate? So Mike Card, you brought up the difference between tolling to pay for infrastructure versus congestion pricing. They may have some different goals and functions which will also have different performance outcomes um, and, and how it's applied to the system. So the policy starts to set up that framework around potentially paying for infrastructure versus um, pricing the system to achieve a congestion outcome, or where you're trying to do both things at once, uh, more of a combination. Uh, we also wanted to update and clarify the goals and the, the outcomes that we wanted to achieve from each of those situations. The next area we really wanted to focus in, again, is understanding, um, and again, the comments were great leading up to this. Mike, you, you teed me up perfectly, by the way, um, is as we think about implementation of tolling, we need to understand we have goals and objectives we want to meet, but one of those goals is around equity um, and, and how is it going to impact the different users of the system. So we set up in the policy the considerations, the factors, the things we thought would be important to help inform how equity determinations and considerations might be made when implementing a tolling program. It doesn't make those determinations, but it gives the framework and the policy goals and objectives. And then obviously one of the big things is also the use of revenue, how you set the rates and what are you trying to achieve from the use of revenue? So being more clear about um, if we are trying to toll for paying for a project, we got to make sure we can pay for the project. Uh, we also want to make sure that those revenues can be used for the long-term maintenance and upkeep of the transportation system where the toll is being applied. If we're trying to price the system to achieve a, a congestion outcome, what kind of outcomes are we trying to meet so we do have a reliable trip with less congestion on the system? So that is an outcome and goal in how we determine what uh, and how to set those rates. Again, the policy doesn't set any of those, those rates in the final decisions, but it sets up the framework of how to make those conversations. The last part I'll make here is this is a statewide policy. So right now we are looking to implement tolling and pricing in the Portland metro area, but we wrote these policies where they could be adaptable and usable across the state. So we need to make sure we're thinking about other parts of the state if, if and when we ever start to consider other areas where tolling or congestion pricing might make sense. Uh, next slide, please. So what doesn't the Oregon Highway Plan policy work do? It does not set those toll rates. So it doesn't say we are going to set a toll of this amount on this particular highway for this particular length. Again, it sets the framework and the ideas and the considerations to go into that conversation, but it doesn't actually set those rates. Nor does it actually uh, estimate the, the revenue or say exactly what that revenue will pay for. Those will still be determined on a project level basis and a specific application to really work through what does tolling and pricing mean for this particular area and what does those revenues need to be used for. It doesn't say where we would toll or price, um, but it does give some parameters of where it might make sense. So where do we have areas that have higher levels of congestion? That might be an area we wanna focus on where congestion pricing might have value and benefit for achieving congestion outcomes. Same thing if we're trying to build infrastructure, is it of a size and scale where tolling really makes sense to be a significant portion to help pay for that infrastructure? 
We also don't get into other types of pricing. We're really focused on tolling for infrastructure or congestion pricing. There could be other types of roadway pricing that we may need to open up as part of the Oregon transportation plan that's going on right now and a future update. But right now we're really focused on tolling for infrastructure and pricing for congestion. So uh, next slide, please. So the areas that really we believe uh, from the policy that will really be important for this committee, for the STRAC in evaluating and discussing the various rules to implement tolling here in Oregon, um, really start to think about how are the factors for the toll projects? What do we need to be thinking about? What are those outcomes we want to make sure we're achieving? How are we going to make sure we're um, getting those um, benefits uh, across different user groups? What, how do we think about a low-income toll program and start to think about different users of the system? Are there exemptions? How would that work? How would a low-income toll program get set up? What are the process, the procedures? What's the oversight um, to those kind of programs? Still recognizing that the Transportation Commission will have to set the final rates to make sure we still can either fund the project, get those benefits that we're trying to get um, out, of the pro uh, out of the specific application. And then finally, the monitoring and review factors. Again, if we're going to be setting rates, we, we know things change. You don't set them and forget it. Uh, we want to make sure we're actually monitoring and reviewing. How is this working? Are we actually collecting the revenue we thought we would collect? How is the low-income toll program working? Is it resulting in the benefits we want? So thinking again in the rules, what does that program and those kind of processes and how do we think about the needed elements for a toll program in the rules? So really, we believe those are some of the primary areas from the policy work that will help inform your conversations. Uh, we're not going to dive into the policies here today, uh, but I will try to be with this process to help answer questions as they come up in your conversations and deliberations. And of course, the, the new policy that was just approved by the commission is available for review by any STRAC member. So, uh, Jamie, uh, with that, I think I'm through with my part of the presentation. And if there's any questions, happy to answer those now. Yeah, any questions for, for Eric as a part of the material that he just covered? Sean? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, for the presentation. And this might be uh, between you and the previous uh, uh, context as well, but curious just on some specifics there too. Um, you know, I know tolling is prevalent in a lot of states across the U.S. and especially on the East Coast. Um, that's a, you, you can hardly get away from them on the East Coast. And so just for our area, it's certainly a new conversation. I'm curious why Oregon hasn't pursued tolling in the past. And then um, specifically around uh, the Hood River Bridge and the Bridge of the Gods, how long have those been operational as tolling facilities? And what, what does that look like as we're considering statewide rulemaking around this conversation? Are those grandfathered in to their current operations or would they be subject to any changes in rulemaking here? Just a little bit more context around that would be great. I will do my best, Sean, and I may have to ask uh, Travis to weigh in a little bit here too. Uh, but your your basic thing is this is not exactly Oregon's first uh, foray into the tolling uh, tolling world. Um, you, you mentioned we do have by state tolling bridges currently in operation. Um, the Astoria Megler Bridge used to be a, a toll bridge. Mm -hmm. um, after the bonds were paid off, the the toll eventually came off. So Oregon does have experience with this. Um, even back early, early in the late 1800s, 1900s, there were toll roads <laughs> that existed that were private and, and how those would work. Um, really, this is now Oregon's foray into the more modern world of tolling and pricing and, and how things would work uh, going forward. Um, back with the stuff I mentioned with OTIA, we were looking at potentially tolling and pricing a couple of projects to help pay for those. It was the Newburgh Dundee bypass and interestingly enough, even the I-205 project. The problem is, or the, the difference, um, the rules about 10, 12 years ago limited the kinds of tolling and pricing that we could implement. Federal rules now allow exemptions to price and toll existing capacity or existing lanes uh, on an interstate system. And that's part of what this tolling program is looking at. So 
the world around tolling, the rules, the requirements, the regulations, uh, just like everything else, continues to evolve and adapt. And what we knew 10 years ago is different than what we know and are thinking about today. As we think about the, uh, the existing tolled uh, infrastructure with the uh, Hood River, Bridge of the Gods, uh, and Cascades Lock, um, Travis may be able to answer a little bit more, but I think we're really talking about what are the toll programs that will be operated by Oregon and under control of the Transportation Commission. Both of those toll systems are actually operated by uh, outside of the Oregon Transportation Commission. Uh, Bridge of the Gods is uh, through the uh, port of uh, Cascade Locks and in a private enterprise. And I think Hood River is similar. Yeah. Um, for Travis. So I don't believe the track work will really impact those particular uh, projects and those operations, but we may be able to learn some things from them as well. So Travis. Yeah, just to add just a little bit of detail uh, is that the, the work of the track uh, will inform administrative rules for the state highway system. Uh, the Oregon Transportation Commission is the toll authority for the state highway system, but the statute ORS 383 is pretty clear that local governments have the ability to toll their own roads, and thus the administrative rules would not directly apply. Uh, there might be partnerships with local governments uh, in the future for you know, use of, of uh, or to interoperate with ODOT's toll system, but it would not apply to them. Uh, they would be able to set their own toll rates continuously in the future, whether that's the existing toll rates that are set for the uh, Hood River Bridge and the Bridge of the Gods or any other toll facilities that come online in the future. Okay, thank, thank you for that. That's helpful in uh, understanding a little bit more of the scope of the rulemaking as well um, in terms of existing tolling facilities. And, um, you know, uh, Travis, if I might ask one, one additional question um, in terms of the history of uh, tolling coming into the for as a, as an opportunity for revenue for infrastructure investment, um, when that uh, statewide transportation visioning panel and tour took place, um, were there any cost estimates associated? And I realize that's a very loaded, uh, you know, question, especially given uh, in inflation rates over the last several years since that tour and everything, and and any other factors that might be included. But was there a a, a number identified at that time in terms of the overall uh, investment necessary? to address the needs um, during that visioning process. And I ask that just to kind of have a better understanding of um, how significant uh, tolling revenues may be in addressing that, that gap. Yeah, at the time, there was a congestion work group uh, that the legislature put together that, that looked at that. And I do not remember what their number was. It was pretty substantial. Uh, and what they realized partway through that process is they were not able to raise enough money at a statewide level in order to meet the infrastructure investment needs in the Portland metro region to address congestion. And, and so at that point, they, they recognized that they were going to need to engage ODOT and direct us to use tolling. I don't have the specific numbers uh, on my fingertips, and they would have changed by now anyway. Right. Uh, the scope and scale of the infrastructure investments change. They were at a fairly high level of saying, we know that the need is here. We're going to give you this much money, and so you're going to need it to look to fill the gap uh, using tolling as a revenue stream and a way to manage congestion with that dual mandate really written into statute. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Eric and Travis. Um, other questions for, for Eric and, and Travis and their team about the program overview or a policy overview before we uh, switch gears and take a closer look at the equity framework and the low income toll report program. Uh, I had a question. question. Oh, I had a question ahead. from a committee member in the chat, Eric, and, and she was asking about the uh, Oregon transportation plan. And you touched on it briefly because the Oregon highway plan is a subset of a larger Oregon transportation plan. Can you speak to a little bit about how that might or might not kind of influence our work and, and what's going on there? Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best without taking up a lot of time because it's a very uh, complex issue. So I uh, apologize, I didn't see that in the chat. Um, the Oregon Transportation Plan, again, is that umbrella plan for all modes of transportation and, and what we're trying to achieve. Uh, we're working on a major, major uh, overhaul of the Oregon Transportation Plan. Uh, in fact, the Oregon Transportation Commission just had a briefing <laughs> of the status of that in January. And we'll be looking to release the, the next um, 
actually a public review draft uh, sometime in March. But the OTP will set, the Oregon Transportation Plan will set those high level goals, objectives, considerations that we want to make sure all modes of transportation are helping to move the vision to the state in, into what our future state would be, recognizing that we don't have the money to do everything. So this version of the OTP will start to set some of those reasonable expectations that it, it's not going to be a utopian society. Everything's going to be perfect. The, the high level vision probably isn't going to happen. So how do we make hard choices? How do we make trade-offs? Um, you know, even using the term starting disinvesting uh, in the system because we just don't have enough money to even maintain and operate the system, let alone do some of the um, the enhancements and, and operational improvements. And how do we balance those goals and objectives? That's what the OTP will set up at a high level. And then the Oregon Highway Plan will go down to the next tier to say, what are the specific goals and objectives on the highway system? How do we measure that to really help inform key uh, investment choices for really the that's the goal of the, those plans is to help the commission inform where and how we invest what kind of outcomes do we want to get from the system so the timing is really perfect there is some very good work coming from the Oregon transportation plan when we think about uh, transportation revenue in the future and, and what does that look like um, Travis can can affirm this but we're proposing some pretty bold conversations around uh, that revenue and pricing of the system is definitely going to be part of that long, long range, 20, 30, 40 year view uh, for transportation revenue going forward in the future. Hopefully that answers that question. And I'm sorry I missed it in the chat. I apologize. I think it was a direct question, uh, a direct yeah. chat to Garrett. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So no, Miss Eric, you're, you're spot on. Other questions, other thoughts, reflections, observations about these uh, the three sections of uh, the introduction to tolling, the program overview, the policy overview, before we switch gears a little bit. Great. Not seeing any. Oh, there's one. Hi, Ethan. Hi. Um, what other states programs, toll programs, work well and why? What other states programs haven't worked well and why? Great, great question. Garrett and, and Travis uh, will, will want to weigh in. Um, you know, I think one of the first things that we, we really want to recognize about uh, what a modern toll system is, is it's not like some of the experiences on the East Coast. I think uh, Travis talked about this. This isn't going to be the um, uh, where you go through the, the booth, throw your coins in or, or whatever it is. It's really going to be uh, a modern type of a system. Uh, and not all states have that, but many states are moving towards that across the country. So I think that's one of the, the critical things. Yeah. Um, there's obviously going to be some best practices about how the back room works, but that's where also this, this rule committee, I think, will help inform some of those conversations. How do we make it as efficient as possible? Um, but yeah, hopefully we'll learn some of those uh, those lessons from other states that do have tolling. But at the same breath, there's not a lot of states that are actually proposing congestion pricing the way we are. Uh, Travis hit upon this a little bit, that many states where they, are, they have congestion pricing, that's pricing certain lanes. It's called a managed lane kind of system where you also have free lanes in the same, same, uh, same facility. Um, this is going to look a little different here in Oregon. And um, so we're also kind of learning on our own <laughs> yeah. uh, using those best practices. But Garrett and Travis, please add, that's kind of my my breath there. Yeah, I'll add just a little bit that, uh, you know, every state's a little bit different. You've got a lot of legacy toll systems that are still ripping out toll booths or still have toll booths. And some of them are not, uh, you know, they're designed as a general revenue source. I think the state of Delaware funds half of its uh state operations based on tolls on I-95. So those are a little bit different. I think the most analogous to us and the one that is often held up as an example, uh, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad, so I can't say it's perfect, is Washington State in the Puget Sound metro region, where in recent years they've introduced tolling on uh, about three or four facilities and have more planned. They did a lot like like us, a you know a brand new toll system. So they're building it, you know, from the beginning, generally with all electronic tolling, uh, like we show on the slide, uh, and building that you know modern toll system from scratch. 
Uh, they've used it both for bridges like the Tacoma Narrows and SR520. They have an express toll lanes on uh, uh, I-405 and, and SR-167, I believe, and now have a tunnel uh, through downtown Seattle, which, as you know, went extremely well for everyone, and nobody was upset uh, when that thing went over budget by about double. So uh, they have had some good experience. We've learned a lot of lessons and had a lot of conversations with them. And I will tell you, just as a casual user of their system, it is easy to use, you know, to pay a toll bill. Uh, I think it took me from the time I opened the bill that I got in the mail till the time, uh, you know, I got the email confirming payment was four minutes. Uh, and it was it was incredibly seamless to use. So we're going to be looking to our neighbors to the north to learn both what they've uh, gone through, that it's good, uh, and, and also some of the challenges they faced. Garrett, anything to add? Uh, great question. I hope we keep it at the forefront of our conversations moving forward, because that's been in our minds for the last few years on it. So thanks for posing that, Eden. Thanks, Garrett. Um, just a note, I see your hand up, Lauren. Uh, Mike Card put in the chat that the freight plan is under the umbrella of the Oregon Transportation Plan as well. At the, and he put in the chat the 2017 plan that's being updated now. So another, another piece of the policy framework. Lauren? Hi, sorry, I'm fairly new to the, the tolling conversation. So um, I'm sorry if this is a, a fairly easy question to answer or one that you've answered before, but um, is there any other state uh, that has or is proposing a toll on their only existing interstate? Um, I guess is my question since um, this is an existing, for us, there's a proposal on a a toll on our one existing interstate system? You know, I believe that there are a number of states that do have tolls on their only existing interstate. Like I think, for example, Delaware, which I mentioned, you know, I-95, if not their only interstate, is their major interstate. Uh, and so there may be other states like that. But as, as Eric also noted, you know, we are proposing a uh, somewhat different approach than a lot of other states are doing in terms of you know, using corridor level tolling uh, and tolling all lanes. So we we are doing something that is a little bit different. So it sounds like maybe some more follow-up needed there, Lauren. Uh, Lanny. Yeah, I just want the comment about congestion pricing and, you know, are other states doing it? And the, the comment that other states really aren't doing what Oregon is looking at doing. I, I hope we're going to look at that question as to why, uh, instead of just saying nobody else is doing it really like we are, so we'll develop our own thing. Uh, a lot of states have had tolling for a long time with modern systems everywhere else. I'd be interested to know what kinds of things cause them not to look at congestion pricing like Oregon's considering. So I hope that and the equity question both when we talk about low income pricing and stuff that we look at what other states have done in those areas. And if they haven't done that, what are the problems that have prevented them from doing it? Yeah, Lonnie, I think we'll be able to get into um, those those conversations through this group. Uh, it's There's a lot of obviously reasons why a lot of it is just mired in, in federal rules and regulations uh, in order to price or toll existing capacity, you have to get a special approval and an exemption. Um, and some of the systems that have been put in place years ago didn't have that as a, even an option. So things, again, continue to uh, evolve and, and change as they go forward. Um, even, you know, 15, 20 years ago, more a lot of these were being built as private um, concession toll road kind of things and, and systems. So, um those, those kind of models, are, I think, are, are falling out of favor, too, for a lot of reasons. So I think there's a lot, thing, a lot of things here to explore. Um, but Oregon is looking at uh, pricing the, these systems to really achieve that overall global congestion um, outcome, especially with the region mobility pricing project. I will add that, you know, virtually every new toll facility that's been turned on in the last 20 to 30 years does use, you know, all electronic tolling. Uh, and has been using time of day pricing, which is what we propose. Uh, if it is, you know, in all lanes, like a bridge or a tunnel, uh, you know, there we are not talking about dynamic pricing, where the price changes based on traffic volumes. 
Some systems do, but that's generally when you have a managed express lane. So uh, we are actually in that way, in terms of the, you know using uh, time of day pricing, fairly consistent with what other states have been looking at doing. All right, thanks for that. Thanks for that question. Um, Shatreen, you, you got your hand up and then Shannon will take you as your as the last question of this section and then we can move on. Um, Shatreen, go ahead. Yes, thank you so much. I was just thinking, um, thank you, Eric and Travis for your information. I was wondering, you know, as we look at the data that we've got um, to kind of consider all the different opportunities with tolling what other states have had, have we made sure that we can put a little earmark um, that that data is going to be different because now we've all gone through a worldwide pandemic? You know, so we look at this pricing, we're like, oh, that was great. This will pull in that, you know, you've got all these references, but we need to say, oh, goodness, <laughs> we have all been hit so differently. And as we look at the, the things to come, you know, folks are still in survival mode. We're not just talking families, we're talking small businesses, we're talking all different elements. So how do we collectively apply that in a healthy way and really keep that on the forefront to say, this is a new, this is a new road we're taking, you know, as we apply it to tolling. And so I don't know if you guys have talked about that, considered that and have that on a, a star on your, on your list of things to do. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Shatreen, I, I don't think we flag that in the policy as a specific area, but um, it still is getting back to how would a tolling program impact people, goods movement, which I think is really going to be part of the STRAC conversation of how we build in those considerations. Still recognizing we also need to maintain and, and develop enough revenue to help build the things and achieve the congestion outcomes. So hard conversations still coming up for the group, but yeah, we didn't specifically go into pandemic, but I think the policy encompasses a lot of different considerations of how different users of the system may be impacted by this program. And that is something uh, that, so Eric's talking from the policy level, we have a whole group of people working at the project level, and I know they are looking at that uh, in their traffic modeling and projecting out and kind of looking around the nation at what other departments of transportation others are seeing in this kind of still yet not fully post pandemic world, like you were saying. So uh, good point, yeah. Shannon, go ahead. Hi, so uh, I just wondering if there's a reason why uh, all lanes are, is the only consideration because is it like a revenue standpoint? It's a logistical standpoint. It's because like I said, not a lot of states do all lanes. Most of them have, you know, where you have a fast lane or that kind of thing. So I'm just wondering why the decision was made to to all lanes. Yeah, and I, I can address that. And, and Eric, you may add a little bit of detail, but uh, you know, I, it's actually a mix across the country. There, there, a lot of new facilities are express lanes, but a lot of new facilities are also all lanes. Like in Washington, they have a mix express lanes on I-405 and SR-167, uh, but also all lanes on the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, SR-520 and the uh, uh, Highway 99 tunnel through downtown. So this actually goes back to our original work that came out of the legislature. We did a value pricing uh, feasibility study, which I have sitting here on my shelf next to me right here, uh, that looked at the, the system in Oregon. And what uh, the engineering company, planning company that did the work, uh, it was validated by the, uh, the policy advisory committee that we stood up much like this body, was that most of Oregon's highways are uh, too small to really accommodate uh, a an express lane. Uh, so, for example, you know when you drive the I four hundred five express lane in uh, uh, Bellevue, it's five lanes, two of which are express toll lanes. So you have three free lanes and two toll lanes for much of that uh, corridor. There's there's some sections that are only one toll lane, and we just don't have that uh, in in Oregon, and we're not a, planning to expand the highway system beyond three lanes. There was just also a scarcity of locations where they found that a uh, express toll lane uh, would actually uh, really have any beneficial traffic impact. Uh, in fact, what it would do generally, the people using that new toll lane would go a little bit faster, uh, but then the other lanes would actually slow down, which was kind of counterproductive. It also was the case they couldn't find a place 
case where uh, an express toll lane would actually be financially feasible uh, in the sense that most of them uh, break even. And so basically you're taxing people without any net benefit uh, and can't really generate enough revenue to make the system improvements that we wanted to do. So we looked at I-205, uh, for example, as an express toll lane potentially to add that uh, section from Stafford Road to Abernathy Bridge, where there's only two lanes in each direction. And the, the net revenue from an express toll lane was close to zero. And so would not have provided any revenue needed to be able to build that infrastructure improvement to be able to create the, uh, create the congestion relief that we're looking for. All right, so Marie, I need you to be our last person in this section. We also have more time at the end of the section before lunch for Q&A and time you know, at the end of our time together for Q&A. So uh, Marie, go ahead. Great, thank you, Jamie. And, and uh, Travis, you teed up my question for me perfectly. But one thing I wanted to mention is that as far as AAA is concerned, when tolls are utilized, we always like to see uh, toll-free routes and or lanes that are always available. So my question is, and Travis, you just mentioned this uh, partially here, but what would these alternatives for projects be here in Oregon? And then, of course, the second part of that is diversion. You know, we've all heard from uh, various neighborhood groups who are concerned about diversion with folks trying to avoid tolls. So, uh, so there you go, Travis. Thank you for teeing that up for me. Yeah, I mean, the, sh the short answer at some level is, you know, after uh, we toll I-205, I-5 would be a, uh, a free route temporarily. Uh, but the overall plan it does involve uh, tolling both interstate routes. And so in that sense, there would not be a uh, interstate through route that would provide a, uh, a, a non-tolled route. We see, you know, most of the traffic comes on or off the freeway system. It's not through traffic. So folks would have some local routes, but as you know, we're really trying to minimize that uh, rerouting and diversion. What we see is there's already a lot of rerouting. I mean, I all the time I get in my car and you know type an address into the Google and it tells me you know to take Lower Boone's Ferry Road for 15 miles uh, to avoid traffic on the interstate. Uh, so there's already a lot of, of through traffic or regional traffic that should be on the freeway that doesn't. We're hoping some of that traffic will move back onto the freeway. Uh, because there will also be some of the traffic from the freeway that will be rerouted. So we're going to have to work on mitigation of those impacts. And Marie, the, the policy work sets up a lot of the framework for those conversations around diversion. Again, every project, every application will be different, right? The, the traffic patterns will be different. They're not the same across the state. So the, the policy sets up how to have those conversations on a project level basis. That gets back to where Garrett's talking about with the 205 Abernathy Bridge and, and Stafford Road section, that would have a different conversation than regional mobility pricing versus something else somewhere else in the state. But we do recognize that as an issue that needs to be thought about in setting up a, a, a pricing or a toll system anywhere. Thanks, Eric. And we really appreciate you all digging in on the, these policy questions. This is a great set of questions. You're really taking this on. Um, so we're gonna shift gears just a little bit as we continue to provide you with a solid foundation for your work. And I'm gonna hand it over to Garrett, um, who is also going to engage Phil and Park to talk about the equity framework and low income toll report program. And then um, after Garrett, we'll hear from Hannah, who will talk about the broader toll road program news and engagement. And then we'll pause for additional questions. And uh, then we'll take our brief lunch break um, after that at uh, 1150. So Garrett, yeah. go ahead. Definitely, definitely. Well, hello all again, uh, my name is Garrett. And um, I really see this presentation, what I'm about to walk you through, really building from Erica's presentation earlier. Um, Dr. Wu, Commissioner Fai, I was also struck by those pre-conventional and, and pieces there. You know, my experience with that, um, uh, I'm the first one in my family to go to college, and it was about by sixth grade that uh, I was kind of on my own with doing my schoolwork. My parents are from the construction and welding industry, and uh, that I had been the one, even from a small child, they wanted to, like, college, you got to go there. Uh, but I didn't really know, like, what are the opportunities or jobs? I knew, like, teacher, firefighter, policeman, like, that limited set of what was actually possible for me. 
Um, and so uh, a few years ago when ODOT was uh, starting uh, work on tolling and hiring on, uh, my experience uh, working as equity professional um, in the education and housing and some of the transportation world, um, they hired me on to help manage uh, the committee here, the Equity and Mobility Advisory Committee, um, how they were interacting with the Oregon Transportation Commission, really to, to start thinking about equity uh, earlier than any other toll project had done in the nation. Um, most times you get to a year, six months, or even once tolling is in place before equity is thought of or, or mitigations you know, are brought in. Uh, so this is really kind of groundbreaking and uh, interesting work here in a way that you're really seeing ODOT change the way they do business. And so uh, the direction for this committee at the very beginning in the OTC charter uh, were the four bullet points you see on the right side of the screen. Um, that to do tolling equitably, we need to look at uh, those neighborhoods that we you know where Shatrine and Shannon are there in Westland, what, what's happening on those local roads to neighborhood health and safety. Um, what that, that uh, what's happening to low income travelers as they go throughout the corridor. And we are, we've learned a lot also, I'm just thinking of our freight and business folks around uh, low wage workers and the need to get to the job or work site even before you get in the truck um, and, and start your route. Well, what's that multimodal? What, what's, how do we grow our transportation options as well? Uh, so it's not just uh, you know somebody who's uh, in, a, in a vehicle, but could there be transit or ride share or van pool or what are these other options that could be involved uh, as a complement to congestion pricing? And then from our engagement and communications, how can we change the way we do business and reach out to groups that haven't been uh, historically involved? And so uh, I think somebody had mentioned before about what have other places around the country done? Uh, so we have, uh, and we'll send links to this group. We did research on what tolling and congestion pricing projects have done for each one of these areas uh, throughout the country. And we had a really robust uh, conversation. So we have a, a great kind of trove of uh, best practices or areas where there um, have been kind of systemic uh, underwhelming or failures uh, so far in the, in the tolling world. Um, so uh, let's go to the next slide. So uh, as the committee was developing that work, uh, one of the first things in equity, it's not just the outcomes, but it's all, how you get there. And so uh, the report you see on the right is from a group called Transform Pricing Roads Advancing Equity. Um, and that's kind of the industry leader report on how do you do congestion pricing and tolling equity. And so uh, we actually have a member uh, who's still currently on our uh, kind of internal expert team who helped develop this report um, and kind of put in this decision-making framework <laughs> for uh, how do we, what, what is advancing equity and how do we get to that process? Um, and so as you can see here on the right left side of the screen, it starts identifying who, where, what, um, looking at what are the outcomes, how are we gonna measure that? Uh, how do, what are the benefits and burdens that come from that system and then choosing an option. And then uh, once it's in place, what's the accountability measures that are put there? And so I would say for this committee um, that, uh, that last, that final step around accountability uh, is directly related to the rules that we're gonna look at. Cause we're gonna look at the rules around uh, once toll rates are and tolls are put in place, what's that accountability, that report back, that adjustment process uh, moving forward. Next slide. Uh, this is a key thing and Erica made a comment about it around you know, equity is at a time can be used as a buzzword and slapped on a bunch of products or, you know, new, but, but I think it's uh, really important to be clear about what you're talking about and who you're talking about with equity. And so on the left side of the screen, traditionally in transportation projects, you have um, in lower income or economic disadvantaged individuals or racial or ethnic minorities. These are basically like the, um, bottom line of, of kind of where traditional historic uh, transportation projects have gone. Um, we've expanded that F, uh, definition of equity and it, it trying to capture more of those impacts for uh, people experiencing a disability, for seniors, for youth, uh, for people with limited English proficiency and households with no vehicle access. 
Um, and in a second, Hannah's gonna talk about the engagement and outreach we've been doing and will continue to do. Uh, but from a technical standpoint, uh, one of the key pieces we've looked at is uh, for those communities, what are their access to jobs, to transportation, and then to social resources that you see here on the screen. So getting to the library or parks or healthcare appointments or school or religious organizations. So we've actually created a pretty technical kind of mapping system. And so as we um, uh, you know, work on running different tolling scenarios, we can see where access is either being gained or where it's being burdened uh, by transfer transportation patterns. Uh, next slide. Um, so Elizabeth, I see your comment in the chat. I'm gonna loop it into here, uh, this report. So um, uh, last year, uh, the Oregon legislature, well, in the year previous in 2021, uh, there was a law passed that said ODOT will need to produce a low income toll report to kind of provide more clarity to what this program would look like, um, which was totally fine for us. We were in the, in the midst of developing that report with the Equity and Mobility Advisory Committee. And um, it really came out with uh, three key options for consideration that will now work on uh, turning into more specific uh, program elements. And, and a lot of the elements of the program, as far as the income thresholds or the type of benefit or how people would enroll, will be uh, you all will be looking at and helping us craft those rules. So that'll be a key part of this committee. So what it, what it said from this report is that at 200% of the federal poverty level, we need to look at a, a either a free or deeply subsidized trip on the system. And that uh, for 400% of the federal poverty level, we need to have a more targeted or uh, specific uh, discount there. And that for, uh, and, and then there was a whole kind of trove of uh, not just providing the program, but making sure people can access it. Uh, inclusively and equitably. And, and we thought about that as well, Elizabeth, around uh, if people don't have mobile access at home or if people want to use cash. Uh, ODOT has made a commitment to have a cash-based option for people to pay their, their tolling. Um, so we are trying to think through that and, and kind of develop that out as far as the operational side of the program. Uh, next slide. So I believe this is my last slide here, and then I want to let Parker Phil say a few words. But we said those different percentages and thresholds in the previous slide. Uh, as you see here on the screen, 200% of the federal poverty level is around 55,000 for a family of four. Um, and then uh, for 400% of the federal poverty level, uh, it would be $111,000 for a family, uh, a household of four. Uh, and the reason why we got to these thresholds is that at 200% of the federal poverty level, a lot of uh, other social service programs like WIC or uh, the food um, or other food, you can, uh, ODOT would be able to use those programs to verify people into it, therefore reducing a barrier on ODOT to administer and people to enroll. And then at 400% of the federal poverty level, we saw that for uh, people to, in the Portland Metro and in Oregon um, to have transportation take up 30% or less of their budget, uh, that we should be looking at that uh, a targeted level uh, around 400% of the federal poverty level. Uh, that also was a place where we heard a lot of feedback on people who would make above 55,000 for a family of four, maybe they have uh, you know higher or lower, but still kind of lower wage jobs, uh, but would be on the roads a lot. Uh, that ODOT should have some type of tiered, you know, program so it's not a cliff if you make $55,501 that you would lose that entire benefit. So that, that's the reason why we looked at a tiered system. Um, uh, Phil and, and Park, I'm going to open up the floor for you all to say a few, few words if you want to about the EMAC process. Mark, you want to go ahead first or? Sure. Um... Yeah, I think I think the the uh, mobility advise the equity and mobility advisory committee did a real good job of uh, coming up with the things that needed to be looked at to to provide equity to this program, um, and and there was pretty much universal agreement about those. 
Um, what we weren't able to do because we didn't have the numbers yet, and I don't think there was agreement within the committee, is exactly what levels uh, of assistance or reduction in cost or exactly who would be exempt. Um, so that, that's going to be the tough part going forward is, is um, picking and choosing from the programs and then deciding what levels those programs should be at. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tag on to, to Park's comments. And, and first of all, I'll, I'll say that, you know, a lot of the comments and questions that this group um, have already raised up to this point are elements that EMAC addressed or looked at and addressed in, you know, to one degree or another. So, you know, EMAC spent, what, uh, two and a half years uh, going into great detail with a couple of subcommittees on a lot of the aspects that have been raised today. So, for example, you know, the cost, um, you know, who's going to share in the cost? How is that going to be mitigated for, for low-income communities? It looked at the issue of neighborhood health and safety through diversion and what kinds of mitigating factors would need to be done. We went really into great detail and looked at what, how are we going to measure that? What are the factors that will determine whether a particular neighborhood is experiencing um, you know, some degradation in the social and environmental uh, situation or if safety is being hindered? So a lot of those elements came together. And um, I, I think the overall broad view of EMAC was that we wanted to make sure that ODOT has a, a trusting relationship with communities that in the past have been harmed. And the way to do that is to not repeat mistakes that have happened in the past. And so I think that's why the equity framework and the trauma-informed perspective that EMAC uh, essentially developed is in fact going to be the important principle that drives this work forward. All right, thank you so much, Phil and Park. Uh, Jamie, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks, Garrett. Mike, I see a hand up before we hand it over to Hannah. Go ahead, Mike. So one of my questions is, I understand the uh, equity format that you guys put together, but one of our goals is to uh, reduce congestion. So if the incentive for these people, taken, I mean, or the disincentive of these people is taken away from the toll roads, how do you perceive uh, these equity programs are going to affect congestion? Yeah, that's a really good question, Mike, because it's not just congestion, but it's also revenue as well. And so we've done some initial analysis at, that's in that low income toll report uh, that really showed that um, if you have a benefit at that 200 percent of the federal poverty level, you actually could raise more revenue and have less than a 2 percent or 1 percent impact to congestion. And the way you're raising or recapturing revenue is that if you were to put a toll and not have um, a low income program. Uh, the transportation kind of modeling and analysis shows that more people would then at that income level avoid the tolls roads itself. But if there's some type of discount or an alleviation of that, uh, of what you that level would pay that 200% or less, um, that you actually would bring more of those drivers, less of them would basically try to avoid the highway and more of them would be uh, using the road uh, because they would receive that that discount there. Now the 400% level, the federal poverty level, that's more people. And that and that's part of the, we did some analysis at the 300% level, but that's, uh, we're gonna do some additional analysis to get to the question you're just asking around, uh, how do we have this uh, program in place, but have it not um, be you know, overly detrimental or take away from the congestion and, and revenue needs we're trying to uh, you know, uh, orient towards, like Travis had, had said kind of at the very beginning. Thanks, Mike, for your question. Thanks, Garrett. Hannah, we are going to spotlight you. Hannah's going to talk with us a little bit about uh, toll program news and engagement. 
and uh, other ways people have been uh, participating and other opportunities to get more information. Hana? Hi, good morning. Um, just want to say thank you to everyone. Is everyone doing okay? Hanging in there? Thank you so much for serving on this committee. Um, can't say it enough. We couldn't do this work without you and you play such an important role. You are a part of our engagement strategy. Um, we are so grateful for the commitment you're making and um, your help to expanding our reach to get out to hear from other communities, voices, um, and use the tools that you have in the connections. So um, when we talk about engagement for the toll projects, um, you know, we have a big responsibility tolling this, this is new. We have a lot of information to share about our projects. We have to share it really widely. Um, we're also looking for input. There are many opportunities to get information from many different individuals that can inform how we shape these projects, um, how we make tolls work for us and the folks that are going to use it. Um, we also have a responsibility through our engagement. We're really looking to increase understanding, um, you know, no toll booths, no stopping, no throwing change in a bucket. Um, how, how is this modern tolling going to work? This is, this is new for us. Um, you know, and we're trying to reach a really wide audience, um, everybody, um, the public, commuters, residents, our, our agency partners, elected officials, businesses, freight, um, and then underserved and underrepresented communities, those equity framework communities that Garrett talked about um, and Erica spoke about. Um, so we have quite a few tools that we use in our engagement. You know, we do open houses, we do surveys, we do advertising, we have a newsletter, um, news releases, social media posts, presentations, briefings. We do outreach with community-based organizations. We work with committee members. Um, and then we work with community engagement liaisons too. And I'll speak more about that in a second. Um, can I get the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so we know that historically there are communities that we have not heard from um, to inform our big transportation projects. Um, so we are intentionally trying to change that. Um, and we know that we need to do things a little bit differently. We can't just rely on the tools that I showed on the previous screen to do that. So we need to bring some real intention and um, to reach our our equity framework community. So again, just to kind of repeat, like who, what do I mean when I say that, the underrepresented, underserved communities. So we're really trying to reach um, people experiencing a low income, youth, older adults, uh, people that may have a disability, people of color, people who English might not be their first language. And so we have a couple ways um, that we're doing that. Um, First off, we are doing multilingual engagement, uh, really working on translation. Right now, um, we have project materials in Spanish, Chinese, Russian, and Vietnamese. Uh, we are also using paid participation for our equitable engagement. You know, really, people's time is very valuable, and the input that they have um, and the communities that they're connected with, that's really valuable for our project. Uh, so paying people for their time and their expertise to participate um, in, a, in a discussion group and really get that, that, that insight into, um, you know, what do people need to see in a toll program for it to work for them? What are they worried about? Um, you know, what are, what are their thoughts on enforcement? What are, what are their thoughts on, um, on tolling? So um, we are working closely with community-based organizations and community engagement liaisons to really help us extend our reach and to work with underserved communities that we wanna bring into this process and also share information about tolling. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit more about our community engagement liaisons. Can I get the next slide, please? So I have a whole slide up here dedicated to community engagement liaisons because 
they're really what makes this work. Like we could not do this work just with project staff um, for many, many different reasons. So community liaisons are individuals who are members of their community and they are helping us get information out about the project, but also helping us bring information back in. Um, we are really fortunate to work with about 12 community engagement liaisons right now, and they help us uh, do discussion groups. They help us um, with the creation of our materials to really think about like, not only are we getting information out, but are we doing it in a way where it's resonating with people so they can really understand the information, help us with communications, materials, and then also other grassroots engagement tactics. So meeting people where they're at, um, you know, it was put in the chat, like maybe there's a digital barrier. So maybe not relying on using social media or um, digital outreach. So doing some grassroots on the ground outreach, maybe going to um, different community spaces um, and having those conversations. Also kind of providing, you know, maybe literally that liaison role between maybe this big, you know, government project um, where there could be a lot of questions, you know, we're seeing kind of here today, there's so much information that you need to be able to provide input, right, on the work that you're doing. So it's, it's the same for community members. So um, our community engagement liaisons, they really um, become very knowledgeable in the project, and they're able to, you know, have a survey, sit down with someone and kind of um, bridge the gap between uh, the information that people need to really think about how they wanna answer the questions or provide the input that we're asking for to make it a better project. Um, they do so much and they're so creative. Really each, um, each community they work in, they do, they do many different things depending on what's the best fit. So it could be something from a discussion group um, where there's really like in-depth conversation to surveys or radio interviews, or sometimes um, social media or digital outreach is really successful. So um, some liaisons have really big Facebook followings and groups and they use social media chats or, or even text messaging. Um, so very creative and very plugged into um, what works for reaching people and hearing from people in their specific communities. So um, I just can't thank them enough for the work that they do because um, we just, we rely on them so much. So, so grateful and um, grateful for you in advance for serving on this committee and um, for the connections that you're going to bring and your your help in, in being a community liaison. So thank you. That's it for me. Oh, actually, um, let me give you some news. Um, sorry about that. Um, so just kind of putting our engagement into context about, yeah, what's going on right now. So um, we just wrapped up a large comment period, um, a round of engagement for our regional mobility pricing project, kind of asking people um, about the, the project purpose um, and what we should be studying and looking at as we go into our environmental review process for that project. So we got well over 4,000 comments. So we're going to be working on digesting those and looking at those and, and putting that into a report and you know making the connections with the project team and then bringing that back out to share um, with what we heard and what next steps will be. Um, and then for our I-205 tool project, um, we will have um, a big round of engagement. We have our environmental assessment that's going to be coming out early this year. Um, so there will be a lot of engagement, um, open house, virtual public hearing, working with community liaisons, discussion groups. Um, so would love your help sharing information and helping get information back in. So thank you. Thank you, Hannah. So we're, we're winding up our morning session um, and uh, we're gonna head into our lunch break. But before we do that, uh, we have a pop quiz for all of you. So we can put the pop quiz on. 
on the screen. And we just want you to put your, uh, your uh, answers in the chat. We'll do one one at a time. And um, this is uh, Garrett's brainchild as a former teacher. <laughs> so no grades, just see how we're all doing. So question number one, we'll do one at a time. How many Oregon counties are represented by STRAC members here today? So just put in the chat your answer. Is it zero well, to three? Oh, sorry, Garrett, go ahead. Also include, uh, we have a few people out of state. So I added them into the answer here. So is it zero to three, four to six, or more than seven? How are we doing, Garrett? Looks like uh, looks like we're rolling in. We got a lot of seven pluses, one, four to six. Um, should we wait for ten more seconds and then? Uh, no, we've got no. drum roll. Answer is seven plus. So Good give job. yourself a point there. Have some <laughs> uh, big prizes at the end. <laughs> oh no! Now you've raised some expectations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, question two: Does ODOT have enough money today to meet all the needs? Yes. No, or maybe. <laughs> like oh, coming in hot. Coming in hot. I, with the coming in hot. I like the uh, all caps and exclamation points. Uh huh. Just standard no's. You know, uh, hesitant on the line. Um, oh, we've got to find it. We've got hidden places, Nafisa says. Uh, so uh, the answer here, uh, from my understanding of it, at least is no. Travis, Travis walked us through there. Uh, so can't meet all the needs. Uh, um, question, question three, how many languages have we translated tolling engagement materials into? Zero to three, four to six, or more than seven? Hana, I'm going to call you up for this answer. I don't, I don't actually know, but I'm going to put you on the spot. What? It was in her presentation, Garrett. I know. I'm relying on, uh, I, I've got teammates here, though. <laughs> Okay, they're rolling in. Four to six is one seven. Somebody went, Shannon went for it. Okay, what's the answer? The answer is four to six. Four to six. Well done. Hopefully, you're keeping track at home. <laughs> uh, question four Which of the following will this track work on? Toll rate allocation, space travel specific toll project investments or tolling customer service rules? Uh, I'm in, in just background for any uh, person who set up committees, you always work on what's the acronym going to be. So there was a good amount here within ODOT on what letters we landed on. We did like the, the modern space travel-ish sounding track. So I'm seeing here if anybody was thrown by that. Um, but so far, no. So far, people, everybody who's put something in the chat has been correct. It's the tolling customer service rules. Well done. Well, well done, done, team there. Yeah. Final question. Uh, oh, what about, oh, go ahead. What about, I know it says toll rate um, allocations, but this group is going to also do the toll rate setting. Uh, so good clarification. So we will set up the framework for what the toll rate tables would look like, uh, but the toll rate setting itself actually occurs in 2024. So after this committee will have met, so that'll be a part, this will be this committee, RTAC, EMAC, the other committees in the public, that'll be a part of a separate and kind of public engagement process there for the toll rate setting um, and, all and, and allocation decisions. So uh, good question though. Yeah, and that's actually a, a good uh, reason to do the pop quiz is those nuances to under, make sure we're, we're all on the same page. Last question, what does OHP stand for? Oregon Happy People, Oregon Highway Plan, Orange Healthcare Plan, or ODOT Hegel's People? Let's see if... Uh... <clears throat> Anybody takes the haggling bait so far? They have not. Um, 
if we put some truth serum on here, we'd figure out some answers there. So we do have Oregon Highway plans rolling in um, and nobody took the Agent Orange piece either. So uh, for those who have answered so far, you have answered correctly. Um, uh, and it, it might be there was not an all the above either. So Ethan, you got that incorrect, but uh, uh, Oregon Highway Plan was our OHP acronym that Eric walked us through. Uh, so thanks everyone for our quick little uh, pop quiz recap for the day. Yeah, just a little recap as we send ourselves off to lunch. Um, we're uh, we're going to just continue to give you your 50, 15 minutes. I know that doesn't feel like a lot. Hopefully that's a, enough to warm something up or uh, make a sandwich or you know, take a bio break, step outside and let your dog out, whatever you need to do. And uh, we'll reconvene at uh, 1215. Um, and we've got the next section while you're eating is a little more presentation for all of you. Um, we're going to be starting our lunch, our return after lunch with another little mentee poll activity. Um, so that's, well, we'll start us off with that. And um, Garrett, is there anything you wanna say for the good of the order before we send folks off for their 15 minute break? All good, see you in 15. All right.
All right, everyone. 1215 comes in fast. Hopefully folks have gotten a bite to eat and did what you need to do to take care of yourself. We'll be doing some listening here uh, for a little bit. So you'll have a chance to uh, eat your lunch. And while folks are coming back, uh, Madeline, can you go ahead and put up the um, the Minty slide for the the next interactive activity and the code in the chat? So just like from the uh, the, the first Minty, you go and you you open a, uh, can you put this slide up before so people remember where to go? Oh, you put it in the chat. So in the chat, there's the link. You just click on the link, you put in the code, and then we're asking for up to three words that describe our future toll system from a customer's perspective. So we wanna, it'll create a, a word cloud and we'll get a chance to see kind of where everybody's at. So you just follow the follow the link in the chat, put in the code, and just write in up to three words. And it's a, it'll populate a word cloud in real time. So you'll get to see what everybody's saying. And as uh, people, you put in the same words, those words just get bigger. And so don't worry about putting in different words, just you can put in the same words. And again, just, you know, you can use the same words. It's what's the words from your perspective, from a customer perspective. What are the three words? And I like it that there's a mix of positives and negatives. It's really you know, that describe our future toll system. And in some ways we hope that it'll describe what we would like it to be, um, but we understand that, that uh, if there are things that are concerning, those are things for us to work on. So go ahead and if you haven't done your three words, keep doing that. And while folks are continuing to do that, Elizabeth Mazara Myers, are you still with us? I wanted to give Elizabeth an opportunity to introduce herself to all of you. Yeah, and apologies, I was late. I'm, I'm dealing with a migraine today, so I had to take oh. some medicine and hope for it to kick in, so. Yeah, um. no worries. <clears throat> so um, you missed the introductions, but yeah. you'll see it in the, you'll get to catch up, but I wanted folks to have a chance to meet you, and I put in the chat what everybody answered, so you can do that while okay, folks are doing so the Minty much. poll. Sure, yeah, so Elizabeth Mazara Myers, nice to see everyone. I am the executive director of the Westside Economic Alliance. Uh, we are a membership-based based organization representing everyone from Intel and the hospital, um, all, all of the hospital systems, uh, uh, PGE, Northwest Natural, as well as a lot of developers um, uh, and engineering firms. Uh, we also represent all of the 13 West Side cities and Washington and um, Clackamas counties. Uh, additionally, we have nonprofit members, so we have a really unique perspective bringing together for um, private sector, public sector, and nonprofit sector. Um, the geography is the west side of Metro Portland, but of course we include Clackamas as well um, as one of our members. <clears throat> and at the end of this process, I hope that I can explain to my members um, what this tolling system will look like and um, allay some fears around how it will affect their businesses. Thanks. Or their Thanks. residents. Thanks, Elizabeth. So it, it looks like everyone's had a chance to weigh in on the uh, on the word cloud, and it looks like we have our cut, work cut out for us. So you know, I think that um, you know there are a number of words there that I think speak to 
folks' concerns and fears and things that we're hearing. Um, and so that's that those were we need to keep those front and center as we're as we're representing customer interests on this track and um, trying to address what we hear are people's concerns about the future. And, um, and then there's some words in here that I think we should strive for. I see, you know, easy as one that's, um, that's come out. So that's, so that is something that we should strive for. So thanks for doing that. It, it's investment. Yeah. Thanks, Sharla. Sharla put in the chat that uh, she, she wished she would have included investment. So, okay, well, thanks for doing that. And we'll, we will um, keep these words in mind. It's good to sort of hear where people are at. We're gonna move over to a presentation around the toll program roles. Um, Garrett and Commissioner uh, Faye are going to work with us on that. So if you wanna go ahead and put up the slides for them, Alan. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, this would have been the place, Maureen Bach, she's my boss uh, up here at ODOT, and um, she's uh, she comes with a wealth of experience uh, specifically in setting kind of developing ODOT's approach for the road usage charge um, and the pilot program on that and uh, really the back office and operations piece there. Uh, she also has some history in, in taxation and how that works with uh, customer interface as well. Uh, so I think some of our opening remarks is we're looking to build the uh, best modern, uh, most inclusive tolling operating system uh, that, that exists. And um, it's been wonderful, I'll just say, to hear from all of the, uh, be in the member interviews and hear from a, a lot of you who have to deal with paying bills to tolling agencies in other states um, and hearing a lot of the uh, critiques and ways we uh, things aren't working and that's great to work from. But then also where can we, uh, beg, borrow, and steal from other places to get a better operating system in place for, for what we have here um, today. And then I'd also say it's been ex excellent to uh, in the interviews is that we have a real uh, a knowledge and expertise around the operations and how the specific account would work. But we also have a lot of interest and in, uh, um, knowledge around uh, income impacts and and how that uh, program needs to be crafted and put in place and how people might be able to um, access that because uh, one of the things we've we've seen and learned about is of these income programs that are associated with tolling in the nation uh, one of the major factors uh, it, it that um, has basically led to their uh, lack of effectiveness is enrollment and that uh, the Los Angeles program, LA Metro's program for low income tolling is kind of lauded as one of the most enrolled in the nation. And, and they're really looking over only at 10 to 15 percent of the people that could enroll have enrolled there. So uh, definitely plenty of room for improvement for here in Oregon uh, for the program that we will stand up, making sure it actually gets to the people uh, that it's supposed to serve. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so this is uh, toll program inputs. This is kind of the constellation of what's going on in tolling. Um, one, there's a lot of decisions to be made here in the next few years. A lot of things haven't been baked in. So there are, it's a real kind of open field in that sense of um, uh, a really important time here that, that you're coming into the work. And so I just wanted to take a second to talk a little bit about what are the other tolling advisory committees uh, uh, happening. Uh, and kind of what are their roles and then what's our role here with the STRAC. Uh, so in the top right corner, uh, you see there's two groups. There's Area Commissions on Transportation and then the Equity Mobility Advisory Committee. Area Commissions on Transportation, these exist throughout the state um, and they, they look at um, uh, and they provide feedback to ODOT and the OTC specifically, uh, but they're not specific to tolling. They're, any kind of projects that would be in region one, which is the Portland region or region two, which is kind of Marion County, uh, Salem area. Um, they, they kind of rate, look at and review and provide feedback on all projects that are going through that. Uh, the equity and mobility advisory committee that we've already talked about before, uh, their main, they've been looking at developing again, those specific areas of policy and, and kind of detailed recommendations for the toll projects. 
Um, and, uh, and that's really going to be their continued focus. Um, and they'll look at the accountability piece and how are we making decisions now uh, within the next few years? And then what is that long-term piece going forward? So the, there's some overlap. That's why we have Dr. Wu here with this committee and that committee around that account accountability piece. Uh, but they won't necessarily be getting into uh, a lot of the customer service rules or other details that we'll have to hear. Uh, they've provided some recommendations, but they're, that, that's again, kind of where there's overlap and then not overlap. Um, if we then, I'm gonna jump us across the screen to the left side. Uh, <clears throat> there are uh, tribal governments and um, ODOT has government to government consultation uh, with tribal governments. And so um, there's questions around our tribal members exempt or do they get a discount or what tribes are or aren't exempt in that process. That's not a part of the work of this committee. There's a separate kind of government to government work going on uh, to work through those questions. Um, all, because the tolling projects are being done here within, uh, these first couple ones are being done within the Portland metro area, um, how transportation funding works is that for, if you're using federal dollars on local projects, they need to go through a regional process for approval. So the JPAC, the Joint Policy Advisory Committee on Transportation and Metro Council, these are both regional bodies, uh, which I believe Commissioner Fai, you're on uh, the JPAC piece of that. Uh, they also will get kind of a vote or, or look at tolling as funding from ODOT to build the tolling program uh, comes in through place. So uh, they had a vote that happened on a regional transportation plan amendment uh, about a year and a half ago. And then there'll be another vote coming up at the end of 2023 when the regional transportation plan is updated with these tolling projects. Uh, and, and that's, uh, but they're more specific to the tolling projects themselves, again, which is separate from the work that we'll be doing, which is our more on the customer service rules um, and the framework of toll rate setting. Um, so in addition to that regional body, I'm moving us down to the, to the regional toll advisory committee. Um, that is a group of uh, elected officials, business leaders, nonprofit leaders from the Portland metro area. And they're, they're primarily focused, they have five key questions. Um, and it really is looking at what's being committed to and brought, in, uh, brought forward with the toll projects themselves. Uh, one of the big questions around uh, in the Portland metro area is how will uh, that uh, enhanced transit multimodal system work with the toll investments? And so the details of uh, like what bus lines or what new investments would go in, uh, that a lot of the feedback on those type of investments because it, uh, it would be needed, you know, ODOT doesn't operate TriMet buses, so there would need to be partnerships put in place. So a lot of that kind of partnership and mitigation and that spe specificity um, is, is run through that toll, regional toll advisory committee. So um, at times in our work, we'll talk a little more conceptually about the operations piece. Uh, and you'll wonder, well, how would that work out in specifics? That's the group, this regional toll advisory group is helping kind of review and look at the specifics of, of that work. Um, also on uh, kind of in addition to the regional elected officials and leaders, um, a lot of the cities and counties that are, are most impacted and just clo close to the tolling uh, group is um, uh, they, they are working on the kind of day-to-day -day details of, uh, for example, we had the question about the coronavirus and how that affects our transportation modeling. That's where ODOT, um, Metro, and others who are doing the modeling work will um, uh, kind of have that interface on a very technical to technical staff level in development of the toll projects themselves. So uh, that work is going on there. Same thing what Hannah said around the engagement in local communities. So finding out like, is there a, um, a farmer's market coming up that we can go to, or is there a local city council event that we should show up to? A lot of that happens through those technical working groups. And so um, uh, I'll jump to us in a second here. Elizabeth, I saw your question in the chat about the regional group being so Portland centric. I can uh, send you the, the membership of that group. It does include Southwest Washington um, and it does include the Oregon Trucking Association. And I believe another group that has more of a statewide uh, feel to it. 
Um, but because it's lo really looking at the toll projects themselves and how that's developing, that's why um, that group was a little more Portland centric or Portland regional centric. And this group here, uh, the statewide toll rule advisory committee, that's why we have those seven plus counties and out of state interests uh, to get, get basically uh, Portland, but also statewide and beyond input on the tolling operations. So that brings us us in the bottom right corner here, uh, the state statewide toll rulemaking advisory committee. Um, and we are uh, we report to ODOT, to ODOT leadership, and, and people like Travis and Marine in, in developing these rules. Um, and that is then prepared for the Oregon Transportation Commission, who will have to make the final um, vote on, on any rules that we uh, work collaboratively on. Uh, next slide. Or, or actually, Jamie, would it be apt to, I, I just unloaded a lot there and we talked about commit, I know a question might be committee overlap or who's doing what or where, would this be a good time to pause maybe, or should I keep going? Yeah, I think it'd be a good time to pause. Hopefully yeah, so folks we, have eaten enough of their lunch to be <laughs> able to participate. So what questions do folks have? Yeah, prim primarily maybe if we have a like a thumbs up, thumb sideways, th like do we generally know kind of what we're working on versus what other committees might be working on? I, I know that can be a confusing piece. Okay, some thumbs, a fill of thumb. Trine, Nafisa, Ethan. Okay. Yeah, and maybe another way to ask the question is um, is there anyone that's still sort of wondering or needs further clarification about who's working on what in the space this TRAC is focusing on? That's a good yeah, question. And, and I, I do have a question and I'm sorry, I was late. So you may have sort of dealt with this early on, but can you define to me what, what when you say customer service or customer experience, like what is that, what are we talking about? Like, what is it that we're, what is it that we're yeah. doing? <laughs> yeah, no, good question. Um, I actually have a more like, uh, that's the next few slides, Elizabeth. I'll get into kind of some of the specifics there. And then uh, closely after the meeting, we'll be sending a work plan that has um, uh, yeah, that laid out in a timing piece. Okay, Sean. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I appreciate the uh, graphic there and trying to get a better understanding of where all those different inputs come from and definitely uh, recognize the fact that a number of groups are talking about similar issues along the way and that those are all just multiple points of of input um you know certainly some specific lanes um, are addressed by specific groups but broadly speaking in in terms of tolling from a you know a, a, a public perspective without getting into the details it seems like there are a lot of groups doing a lot of the same uh, kinds of conversations um but maybe it, it might be helpful as it'd certainly be helpful for me um to see where specific decisions are made um, as opposed to various inputs. Um, so, you know, obviously the OTC has the ultimate authority to set the specific rate, though this group is going to help set the rate tables. Um, so may maybe, uh, you know, a list or, a, or an infographic, for example, to show where those decisions are actually going to be made so that everyone can have a better understanding of inputs versus decision-making processes. Yeah, that's a really good point. We had developed the graphic for the regional toll advisory committee meeting that walked through some of that at our last meeting. So we can okay. bring that forward. That's a good point though, Sean. That'd be great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks, Sean, for that. Lauren, go ahead. Yeah. So along those lines, I think it also would be helpful. Um, so of those decision points on also the decision to toll and where those tolls are. So uh, where the decision point was on the decision to toll on I-5 um, and when that decision was made and who made that decision versus a decision, the decision point to toll at the two locations on 205. So just so that we know, because there's all these different groups that have been making decisions. And I think that that, that would be important as well. I mean, especially because like when we talk about like, you know, like a regional group that's Portland centric versus a group that would actually be commuting into Portland, 
is different, right? So if I live in Portland, I would care less about a toll on Boone Bridge if I'm someone who were, lives in Salem, but works in Portland. So that would impact me differently. And so I guess that it would be important, I think, to see sort of where those decision points are being made as well, um, just so that we have kind of a clearer picture of where all of these different decision points are being made um, as the we talk about the customer service sort of spots and then where the decision points are being made for um, the consumers who are going to be utilizing these tools. Uh, what our options are for um, uh, the decision points as far as minimizing uh, different effects to different consumers, um, maybe that are outside of, like I like I pointed out when um, we were talking about um, like an ag consumer versus, because um, we talked about how it would disproportionately affect um, maybe someone of a lower income, but when you think about an ag commodity, that's a dis, that's an effect that maybe hasn't been considered yet. And so where our decision point would be, how would we, um, where would be the, the discussion point where we talk about how it would affect an ag commodity versus a different type of good that would be transported over? Okay. Yeah, I, th I think I heard three kind of buckets. One being what are the decisions that have made been made kind of to date on it? Kind of how did we get because I we're we're working on the operate under the operation that it's not kind of a if tolling question but a how where when so is yeah. that so do you still so yeah I'm, so I'm I don't hearing, think it would be yeah. helpful to know since it seems like we're working on the not the if the when so kind yes. of how do yeah. we get to the win and then um also where when you talk about our work plan where are the decision points where we could talk about mitigating different effects to different groups um, would be helpful yeah. too. Yeah, then I think, so just to parse out a little bit, like um, I think the when piece of kind of, because uh, you brought up the example of like, where will the toll gantries be or when, you know, how will it be phased in? Um, I can I can bring you some of those information on those timelines and how that'll work. That will be, I would say, probably outside of the scope of our committee. Um, but the the piece you mentioned around like, ag users versus low income versus other group like that will be within what we look at when they we look at the exemptions piece so i think when we uh come out with the work plan um hopefully that'll help provide more uh specificity there on the timing and when that happens uh but for those other two pieces we can work on getting that uh out to the committee and over to you thank you yep Any other questions at this point? We've got a couple more slides and I believe we were gonna hear from uh, Commissioner Fay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it might be good now, Commissioner Fay, if you wanna share anything about the Regional Toll Advisory Committee, the work that's been going on there, and then I can jump, because I'm gonna talk about this committee's role kind of after that. Yeah, I think, um... I don't know if you have a slide prepared, to, but um, I think the idea of, I'll just tell you what the group has been interested in to talk about. And mm -hmm. we have not had a sort of robust or any in-depth conversation, but the group is really talking about how do we balance this congestion pricing versus revenue generating purposes of tolling. And the piece about how do we, how do we, when do we talk about the sort of the gross net, the gross annual versus the net revenue. So I think that's the, what the group have been, sorry, I'm getting a call. It's like, as soon as you start talking, your phone blows up. Um, I'm not sure it happens to everyone, but so that I'm, we, <laughs> with the other challenge for our group is we also have been discussing more of the discussion have been of the group and I think sort of a barrier for the group has been like finalizing our charter because people don't feel comfortable moving forward with the charter because we haven't had sort of the revenue conversation um, so 
and the investments. How do what are we going to invest some of these revenues? I personally am interested in seeing how do we gonna, you know, how do we invest some of the money that's going to be being um, collected from the tolling, and what amount of that revenue will go towards sort of other complementary uh, ideas and elements. Um, so we've heard from that committee, we've heard a complementary transportation element and how that will complement public transportation. Uh, so I don't really have like um, any prepared remarks around the regional toll advisory, but just know that that committee exists and and is also advising around the revenue discussions and there might be times where you know i come to this group and say hey you might want to have conversations with some of the people who are participating if there's or there might be some times where i take some what are we are discussing to that group and say you know this is where this track committee is heading around operations and rates um, how do we align ourselves uh, in terms of the discussions around revenue investment? So, I don't know. I I think uh, it's a it's the revenue piece is a roadblock for um, a lot of the members, including myself, for that committee. And I think once we have an understanding of what you know, how, where do we divide? Where does transit fit in? And some of the investments. Um, where does diversion and mitigating diversions for some of the folks who are immediately impacted of tolling um, is going to, and then also I think uh, the 205 immediate project is also in the play uh, because there's that project that's going around and I think it's going to be a model. So I think there's a lot more questions than to answer um, than we've gotten answers, I would say, Garrett. Uh, but but I appreciate the, the teams from ODOT sort of collecting any of the questions from um, the team. And I myself send some questions for the ODOT team to answer. And I would say to you, Garrett, and some of the questions I think will be ideal to receive some answers, um, you know, that I've been gotten and to try to figure out is, you know, which which industry, commercial industry will be subsidized or um, what are the, some of the rates that's gonna be for um, autos versus trucks. Uh, so I'll keep collecting questions that I get from the community that's specific to the STRAC. And then um, I've been collecting questions that will be specific to the regional toll advisory. And I think, uh, uh, Elizabeth's question around why is it Portland centric? I think uh, that has been few meetings discussion of to try to diversify and really make it a robust uh, committee that is uh, regionally representative. And I think we're still keep identifying. I think at uh, last meeting, I saw some members that were from the West Lynn city. We had the mayors attend. And so I think that group is sort of fluid keeps changing I would I think uh, because there's we're adding um, more people and who's missing and I think there are a lot of people who are sensitive to the idea of like what voice is really missing rather than who uh, and I appreciate that you know because it's not an individual person or individual entity we tend to say this particular business or this chamber is missing but sort of saying what voices are missing and to try to bring that voices so um i i will say um yeah i think i don't want to take up too much time but i i think members there's i've had side conversations or off Know, on the phone conversations about my representation of as a Washington County Commissioner uh, on the regional committee and then on this committee as the representative of that regional toll advisory committee. So, but, you know, I'll do my best to try to be a representative that brings the regional perspective and, and, and also keep an eye on 
folks who are immediately impacted on tolling uh, right now, and and then also figure out there's creative ways to invest um, and uh, really truly mitigate congestion rather than uh, deciding that all the revenue is going to go within that corridor and stay within that corridor. So I'm happy to stop right there and see if there's any questions. Uh, Elizabeth, I appreciate the comment. I saw your um, chat. Yeah, and th thank you for the update. I think that's totally fine, Commissioner Fai, as far as <clears throat> sharing your experience so far and where the committee's at and where they're trying to formalize around. Um, and then Shatreen, to your question, I think Sean mentioned this as well in his comment. Uh, these committees, a lot of times, can it seem like working on a similar topic, but we see it as different parts of that topic. So we are thinking of ways, whether through information sharing or uh, liaisons like this, to to um, help that be less of a burden for people to navigate to figure out uh, what questions are being weighed in on where. So uh, work in progress, and and always open for feedback on how we can improve that. So. All right, Garrett, how about we hand it over to Kelly? Uh, well, I Kelly's... had a, a few slides on the back roll. I want to Oh, go. do you? Are you going to yep. do that? Yeah. OK. All right, so um, our existing rules. So how, uh, if you haven't been a part of rulemaking before, just a quick kind of context of what rules are. Uh, we have Oregon Revised Statute, ORS, and those are the laws that are set by the legislature. Um, <clears throat> and then you have what Eric talked about, which are the policies that are set in the Oregon Highway Plan. Um, and a lot of times there's a, a bridge between those two, and that's called uh, rulemaking or, or Oregon Administrative Rule, OAR. Um, and what it does, it, it helps uh, kind of better clarify what's happening uh, in statute or what was meant by that to then direct uh, and connect to the policies uh, that are in the Oregon Highway Plan and then direct ODOT uh, and, and the um, customers to know kind of what this interaction, how this tolling system is going to work. So that's kind of what rules are trying to accomplish. Um, in rulemaking, you always have a balance between uh, providing specificity uh, to so people and ODOT can know how to operate, uh, but not trying to be overly specific as far as to tie your hands into a process that once you put it in place, you find out that you immediately want to kind of revise that or it's not effective because uh, then you have to start all over again and go back through rulemaking work. Um, so our current rules are in this section here and we can put a, a link there for you but it's 731-040-0010. Um, and if you go to that section, you'll find uh, actually not a lot of rules exist today. Um, there are, the rules that are there today are a lot about accepting tolling projects, either on a state highway or on an interstate highway, and how they would be evaluated to just be accepted as projects by Oregon, uh, by ODOT and the OTC. Um, there's a lot of work I'll get to here in a second uh, that that basically doesn't exist today that we're going to have to create uh, from that best practices and with you with your help. Um, do know that uh, these rules uh, are for uh, projects throughout the state, like we had mentioned before, or there, well, there's not currently projects planned throughout the state, but that could be their effect into the future um, if new toll projects were to come online. Uh, so we are, we do have some examples here with the 205 toll project or an interstate bridge or a regional mobility pricing project, but these rules are meant to kind of govern that, uh, that tolling as a system. Next slide. So uh, to Elizabeth's question, uh, what do we mean by tolling operations or rate framework? Uh, so we mean by customer accounts. How do you sign up for account? How does the transponder work? Uh, you know, what what's information is ODOT going to need uh, or, and keep? Uh, are there fees associated with maintaining that uh, transponder account? What's the cash-based option? What are those in-person options that you would do uh, to sign up or to maintain your transponder? Um, does it, uh, when, when do you get the bill in the mail? Uh, or is it just an online or electronic transaction? Uh, or if you didn't have the transponder and we picked up your license plate tag, uh, how does that work on, on the back end system as far as that billing or enforcement? 
Um, what are the civil penalties or administrative fees that are associated with that? How long does somebody have to pay back um, a tolling fine or a bill? Um, uh, and dispute provisions. Uh, and I learned this a lot from when we talked to some of those in the trucking industry. How do we set up a, a place where if you have a large fleet of vehicles, um, you're not encumbering so much administrative costs trying to uh, rectify you know, bills that shouldn't be bills, I think. Uh, we, we, I heard pretty commonly that that's a real problem uh, with some of the tolling systems that exist today, that it's not just the cost of paying it, uh, but it's the cost of uh, administering and disputing those, those penalties. So um, that, that's the type of work we'll jump into there. So what we'll do, work planning for the committee, we're gonna spend a couple of months on those. We might take a, a month break and check in with the Oregon Transportation Commission and see where, if they have feedback on the feedback we've been developing as a group. And then our, our part two of our work as a committee is gonna be on the toll rate framework. So um, what's the low income discount? So building off the policies that are in place today and that report that was developed, um, is it a credit, a discount, how much of a discount or a credit is? Uh, how does the how do people again sign up for that? Similar to the questions in the first point, uh, but in the second, uh, from an equity lens, should there be um, reduced fees or discounts or a maximum of total fines somebody could accrue from tolling? Um, or what happens uh, if you're in the low income program and your bill is past due or you go to uh, you know zero in your account? Uh, so there's a lot of questions, not just about what would be provided, but how it will actually operate, we'll dive into. We'll then look at the rate schedule framework. Uh, so what that means um, to establish toll rates in Oregon, you need to uh, have those specific rates put into rules. So what will our, our version, the work of our committee, what we'll do is we'll set up the tables, we'll look at uh, uh, do freight or other vehicles, do they pay the same? Do they pay more? To what degree would they pay more? Um, that, that kind of leveling there uh, uh, we'll, we'll look at and we'll get into. Um, uh, and then the uh, vehicle, so that's, that's a part of like the vehicle rate structure and rate schedule framework. Also, uh, how would adjustments be made into the future? How, how often would toll rates be looked at? Um, uh, who is involved uh, in that future toll rate decision making? What mo what factors are we monitoring to see is the tolling achieving the outcomes we wanted it to do uh, from a tolling system and specifically for the low income toll program? And then uh, what are the exemptions uh, that are going to be provided or other discounts uh, in the policies that Eric walked through? and in, uh, uh, in federal law a bit as well, uh, there's uh, public transit vehicles are exempt from paying tolls. Um, uh, emergency response vehicles, uh, such as police, fire, EMS, they're exempt uh, from paying tolls in policy. Uh, but we also have a policy that looks at um, some of the, whether it be uh, user types. Uh, so we mentioned like, uh, somebody mentioned agriculture today, we've heard of like healthcare providers, or maybe there's a specific geography um, that uh, would should should pay or look at delayed tolls or discounts. Uh, that's set up in policy that ODOT should look into that. Uh, so uh, through the work of this committee, that's where we're going to look at really having those conversations to see uh, what makes the most sense and what lands in the, the rules uh, themselves. Uh, so next slide. So I just mentioned a, a lot of details and we'll be diving into those details. Um, uh, Jamie and myself and the team, we've tried to think of a way of how do we, um, how do we set up this conversation to where we can kind of uh, start big and start with your thoughts around uh, what are maybe some of the sideboards, what are past decisions, guidance, what, what's the information expertise that you're bringing, uh, even without looking at the rules on uh, what are best practices and what we really need to get right. Uh, so that'll be kind of our first, first month of discussion. So expect your February meeting to be on that, on that first bucket of materials. And then the subsequent months, you'll see uh, either the, the complete kind of draft or segments per topic of what those draft rules would look like. Uh, we'll refine, refine, We'll take that to a third 
uh, level then um, and uh, have another iteration where you're looking at kind of edits made to the feedback you gave on that first draft of the rules. So we see this happening kind of in two cadences. One, uh, these level one, two, three to deal with the operations piece. And then going back through that same level one, two, three to deal to look at the toll rate uh, structure, framework, vehicle exemptions, that piece there. Um, so as that's occurring and happening, uh, just to reiterate what I mentioned before, uh, the specific rates uh, for the 205 toll project, um, that comes into effect in 2024. Um, the reasoning for that is we have to wait on what's called the level three traffic and revenue analysis. It's an investment grade traffic and revenue analysis. And we need to wait for um, some of the toll projects, the toll project itself, the 205 toll project to get federal approval, um, uh, which will happen later this year. And so those steps have to happen before then the OTC and ODOT uh, through with you all and the public takes a look at what those that rate structure would be. Um, but we do have rates that will uh, have been studied uh, in the 205 toll project that we can use as kind of examples or a lot illustrations uh, to help get a picture a little bit around kind of what rates are we looking at and revenue estimates. Uh, so at least to provide us some context uh, for how we might go into fine tuning the rules. All right, with that, uh, oh, actually last, one more slide. Uh, I'm not going to go through this piece by piece because you have an excellent handout that was sent in your materials. Um, and I can see it's also, I too have to like move my head to be able to read it. Uh, but, but I would say go to your attachment. That might be a better visual because it basically lays out that uh, this rulemaking process, the part we're working on is really this first circle. Um, and that there, even after the work of this committee is done, uh, there are uh, many other steps and subsequent steps with the Secretary of State um, and then the Oregon Transportation Commission where there are additional inputs for public engagement and input. Um, and so this is just to show you that the rulemaking process, you're the kind of first up piece into um, steps that'll happen uh, that are required by law to happen before uh, the rules can go into place. Uh, Commissioner Fai, I see you have a question. Thank you, Garrett. I had, um, I'm looking at the six, four to six months. So does that mean in four to six months, this, this committee will sense that? Yeah, it'll probably be more the six to eight months, but that that's around the timing we're seeing for, for this committee. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, Shatreen? I actually just had a question and I don't know if there's an answer yet, but I was thinking about the tolling pricing. And when we get ready to talk about that, do you know if they are looking at, if we're wanting to come to a decision on pricing that is going to include trying to pay off, like, so I'm thinking about Abernathy, you know, the, the monies it takes to do the bridge, the seismic improvements in that plan. And then also all the admin that we were talking about behind it, that's gonna come to that. Is the pricing considered like are they trying to be really robust and knock all of that out first or can it be is it more of a long term are we talking about a long term solution or is that what we're all going to discuss does that make sense yeah that makes sense i think what you're getting to is kind of what's the financing plan behind because it takes money to develop the toll pro program itself in addition to the projects and the mitigation that it would fund um we won't as this committee, our scope isn't to dive into that piece of it, but that's where Travis and the ODOT team, that's information we can we can bring along as the as we do the work. But that's uh that is a that it's an important product, uh, but it's one that's being developed and, and we can bring uh, as we have that information. Ethan. Yeah, I wanted to um, kind of follow up on some comments or questions that Warren alluded to, um, and it got me thinking, and then the mention of the rate structures. Is it, uh, is it this group's mission or part of that mission to start differentiating uh, 
with respect to commodities and commercial user groups when it comes to rate setting? In other words, where is that question, where is that discussion going to be held? Uh, because I see if we are talking about ag versus construction materials, that's a pretty intensive granular discussion about whether to allocate certain pricing or reduced pricing based on the commodity uh, shift. Is that a discussion that this group is going to entertain? That's a good question. I believe the answer is no, just because from a technology standpoint, I don't think we can delineate between that type of user. But Travis, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I would say that uh, we really have not contemplated differential rates by commodity, and, and I'm not aware of a system in the United States that does that at any level. So I think that's something that's not really on our radar screen and not something we're really uh, planning to entertain. Other Thanks. questions? Not seeing any. So Garrett, are we ready to move into the, the charter conversation or was there another piece that Kelly was going to chat about? No, no, Kelly was going to take lead on the charter. So if okay. we're ready for that, well, we can turn it over to her. Great. Hey, Kelly. Hello. Hello. So just for everybody on the group, um, what, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to take the, we're going to walk through the charter as a document, and that way we can make um, real time, you know, any comments or, or, you know, ed edits to it. The, we're, we're taking a deliberate sort of slow walk through the charter with all of you for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is it's a foundational document that serves um, our purposes. So for all of us, so we know, you know, what's expected of us, uh, what our role is, how we're going to work together. So that's really important. And, and but also because we're going to ask you to sign it um, at the end. And so we want to make sure that this document works for you. And we ask you to sign it as a demonstration of your commitment to the process, as well as your understanding of what we're asking you to do. And so that's why we're taking a, a, a deeper dive. We've allocated, you know, an hour and a half to walk through this. Certainly if we get go through faster, we can end our meeting a little early, but we don't wanna rush things. We wanna make sure that people are comfortable with what's in the document, especially since we're asking you to sign. So I, I just wanted to set that up, Kelly, before I hand it off to you to talk a little bit about um, how the charter was developed and how ODOT uses charters. Sure, thanks. Yeah, so chartering our advisory committees is really um, a standard practice for ODOT. And as Jamie just kind of pointed out, it really helps keep us all on the same page, kind of set the expectations and the guiding principles for how we work together, um, and really ensure that shared understanding of the group's goals, objectives, purpose, and scope. So that's really kind of the, the, the main um, focus of that. Um, this particular charter is modeled after other advisory committees um, that we have, uh, though each one, of course, has its own little nuances um, based on whatever the objectives or the, the purpose and scope of that group is. Um, and while most of the content in the STRAC charter is pretty standard and common, one thing, <clears throat> excuse me, one thing that's um, maybe a little different is the equity statement. That's something that's um, somewhat new that we're starting to embed in all of our charters. And it's something we really wanna engage in conversation with you um, this afternoon about. Uh, and if you kind of think back to the conversation we had earlier today with Erica, um, it's really um, intended, the charter overall is intended really to just help us be more intentional about the approach to this important work and that uh, using that equity lens, because um, you're embarking on quite a bit of work over the next several months. so. Uh, it's important to keep us all on the same page. So uh, with that, uh, does anybody have any questions before Jamie starts kind of walking us through? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth asked if someone could drop the live link for the toll project equity framework into the chat. So if one of the ODOT our ODOT team folks can do that. That would be great. Maybe Garrett? Yeah, Garrett probably has quick okay. access to that. Thanks, Garrett. 
Um, and uh, Madeline, can you make it just a little bit larger since we'll be walking through and really looking at each section by section? So Kelly, I'm not sure if there's anything more you wanna share about um, this preamble and the background. Uh, and you already talked about the equity statement, so. Uh, no, I think I think I covered it unless okay. I have any questions. All right. So uh, if folks are okay, we're just gonna go ahead and move on to the charge and responsibilities. And unless somebody stops us, you know, with a raise hand um, and I can call on you, we are moving through this. And e so each section where we are um, assuming that you're comfortable with it, unless you stop us and say, hey, what is this? Or we need to change this, or I don't understand this. So that's how we're gonna walk through this. So ch charge and responsibilities, purpose and scope. Um, so Kelly, did you wanna say, just introduce this piece? Sure, so this is really um, exactly that, <laughs> laying out the purpose <laughs> um, and the scope of the STRAC. Um, so uh, helping to try to bring some of that clarity. Um, and as you can already see from the prior discussions, you know, there is some, uh, I guess I would call it gray area um, between the various groups that are um, involved in this. So this is just one more uh, point of uh, clarification, if you will, to help kind of identify what's the STRAC scope and, and, and what's not the STRAC scope, right? So trying to keep clear on that. Hey, Madeline, if you want to just scroll through and we'll pause. Um, if it, it's anybody have any heartburn questions, does this seem clear to folks before we talk about out of scope? Okay, so out of scope. Oh, there's Mike. Hey, Mike, go ahead. Um. Just, I mean, you, you made a comment that <clears throat> if we wanted to change this or we weren't comfortable with this, <clears throat> you know, one of the things I think about, and I'm trucking, obviously, and we compete in our farm, farmers have to compete with people outside the state of Oregon. And our our uh, transportation network is a critical point of our competitiveness um, to sell our products and to have businesses in the state. And I don't see anywhere in our charter that we, we keep competitiveness as part of our scope. I mean, is that, do we not care about that? If, if we want to throw it in there, what's, how do we change the charter? To, I mean, it make, is there a chance that we could change the charter? I don't know how to do it. Do you, when you were through the charter, Mike, was there a place that you thought adding something like that, um, that there was a, a place that you thought that made sense to add? Yeah, could we just go up just a little bit on the slide where it says, um, you know, <clears throat> framework, the principles and policies set by the OTC and the Oregon Highway Plan and other directions, congestion, revenue, climate, and equity, all great things we should consider, but it doesn't say um, competitiveness because the, like the Oregon freight plan, we have to have a good competitive infrastructure. We've got to be able to have our, our small businesses competitive. They've got to have good freight rates. They've got to have good transportation. You know, they can't have slow transportation because of congestion. I mean, we have to have a competitive marketplace for our Oregon businesses. I just think competitiveness, we've got to keep that in mind. Are those, are, are those, um, is competitiveness spoke to or highlighted as a part of the freight plan or some of the other plans that ODOT has adopted? Because that might be a way to make sure that we're, you know, keeping that as a part of our reference. Well, you know, I was part of the freight steering committee when we first wrote our, our freight plan in Oregon back in 2011. And it's been modified a couple times and I'm not even sure what the current plan says, but I know that when we talked about having a good freight network, it, com com competitiveness with other states and other networks was important in that. And I don't know if there's any language in it to support what I'm saying, but I mean, it just makes sense to me that if we have something that hurts our businesses in the state, we shouldn't, I mean, if this doesn't work for our businesses, we should probably 
consider that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what I'm trying to get at is I'm wondering if, you know, the language here says uh, the principles and policies set by OTC and the Oregon Highway Plan and other direction. So I'm wondering if in, 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 as a part of the Oregon Highway Plan, the business uh, considerations and business competitiveness is already up there. And, and so that's already a part of our considerations. That's what I'm trying to sort yeah. out. Yeah, but you've got you've got it in parentheses, kind of you calling out the, the stuff that we need to consider, uh, the principles and policies that we need to consider set out by these things, kind of are these four things. I mean, I I think we should add competitiveness. Yeah, we've so, got a flurry, we've got a flurry of hands. So let's hear from a few folks. But um, Kelly and Eric, you've got you went ahead and unmuted, so maybe you've got some clarity, and then we'll hear from Lauren. Uh, yeah, just a point of clarify, clarity on the four items that are in parentheses, which I think is what you might be referring to, the congestion, revenue, climate, and equity. Though Those are specific um, areas that the commission has called out for tolling. So that's why those are specifically mentioned. But, you know, um, the intent here is that all the po policy information in the highway plan and, and other direction, policy type direction, um, plus the house bills need to be considered. So just, just to clarify that. Eric? And that's where I was gonna go as well. So Kelly and I were thinking along very similar lines. Um, and, and Mike, I think you know what you're getting to is making sure that the goals and principles of the freight plan are also considered in how we think about implementation of a toll program. I don't think it quite gets to the competitiveness language. I know that was a theme. But it really gets more to the the cost effective and and being responsible, reliable. Um, those kind of things are built in. So maybe an easy way is just not to cite uh, one specific plan, but just the OTP and all of the policy plans underneath it to help form and and provide a framework for for this rulemaking exercise. But I, the commission was pretty clear, and even the Oregon Highway Plan. Uh, toll policy, these are kind of the four uh, major theme areas that the commission really highlighted. Yeah, so Madeline, I think the language that Eric was offering is the Oregon Highway Plan and all the policies. How did you frame that, Eric? All the policies within it, contained within? Well, I think it's you framework the principles and policies set by the OTC in the Oregon Transportation Plan and the subsequent mode and topic plans. Yeah, and Kelly put some language That's in the chat. That's all inclusiveness then. You, you do all. Right, yep. Yeah, thanks for that clarification about why the things are in the parentheses. I hope that that helps, Mike. It seems like it did. You were nodding. Um, Lauren, go ahead. Um, I was just going to chime in to say I would agree and I would be more comfortable if something like competitiveness or the economy was specifically called out. But I'll also say that, I mean, for my, from for the people that I represent, I would say that it would also, I think I could also categorize it under um, the equity across their industry as far as how they can um, uh, adapt to a toll and, 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 and what that would do to their industry and their ability to recoup a loss. Um, and so how that, the equity of how that would affect them versus another industry. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I can represent their interests under that, but I would be more comfortable if there was something here that reflected the fact that um, uh, business, certain businesses, small businesses, um, our economy and our competitiveness will have a direct effect. Um, and it would be nice if it was represented here in a way that we could represent them as uh, people who will be interacting with the tolls. So, so Madeline, in your comment, can you just add, um, explore how to include economy and business? You know, let's make sure we don't, I don't want to lose those words. Thanks, Lauren. Shannon? Oh, yeah, by adding that, that was all I was going to say, is I wanted to make sure small business was uh, thought of as well, so she covered that. <laughs> okay, Elizabeth weighed in on the chat. Uh, she's okay with some language around business so that we remember that it's not just the individual driver that will be affected. So, and I think that Lauren, where you were going is, you know, if we're thinking about equity in a larger sense, um, then that's, I think that was, that was helpful to have you share what, how you're, when you look at equity, how you're thinking about it. But it sounds like there's a fair amount of interest in including 
something, some language specific to economy or business um, as a part of this. Other thoughts on the charge and responsibilities before we move to a next section? Okay, let's go ahead and move down to out of scope and just pro a process check for everybody. So, you know, we want it, we want you all to take this charter on and do exactly what we're doing. We will um, make notes. We're not going to wordsmith. Um, and then we'll send, we'll do our best to incorporate your, um, your input and, and your edits. And then we'll send around a draft and see if that hits the mark for folks to uh, sign. And we'll send it out in a, a fillable PDF so that you can have a chance to review it and, um, and sign it electronically. So that's our, that's our process. So out of scope. Kelly, anything you wanna emphasize here? Uh, just that, again, this uh, kind of goes with the previous uh, conversation about you know, what groups are working on what, and you know, again, trying to, sometimes it's easier to understand what's in scope if you know what's out of scope. Um, so that, that's why we like to put that in. Yeah. Everybody's clear on what's out of scope. And we've touched on this at several points in our uh, meeting today already to make it really clear. I have a question. Sure. Jamie, to for Kelly. And I think um, I asked the same one earlier to Jared. And when Mr. Travis came and presented to the Regional Toll Advisory Committee. One of the, he talked about what's in scope, out of scope, kind of a, for this committee. And some of the things that we're focused on for the focus will be is toll operations, toll rates or framework. And out of scope here says, second bullet point, create or advising on toll policy criteria or principles to govern toll program or rates. It seems like I think where this group's hands will be shackled to get involved around the tolling operations and toll rate framework. So how do we address that bullet point and reconcile what's in scope for as a committee? Here. Thanks for your question, Commissioner. Um, Kelly, do you want to take that or kick it to Travis? Well, I, I was going to kick it maybe to Eric even, because um, I think this, this goes back to part of what um, both Travis and Eric touched on in terms of there's the policy piece of this, um, which is what governs those things, and those things will inform the work of this group. So that's kind of that fine line and a little bit of gray area um, between um, the rules and the policy part. So Eric, Eric, do you want to add to that? Or Travis, if you're still here, I know Travis had another uh, commitment. Yeah, I can do my best. So Travis may have to weigh in as well. But uh, Commissioner, I mean, it, it really is a good question. It's, it's right along the line there. Um, we're really looking for the this rule advisory committee to figure out the how to implement, not the absolute value of what those those rates would be and, and some of those those kind of decisions. Um, some of those will will come into play obviously in in the uh, final analysis. So um, I believe uh, <clears throat> it was Garrett that talked about the phase three, which is the investment grade traffic and investment analysis. That's where we actually really start to figure out what we can collect revenue wise with all those various assumptions to be able to pay off the bonds, uh, specifically if there's a, a bond reinvestment piece with it. Because um, that's really how a lot of the tolling revenue works is we we have a regular revenue stream that can then pay off bonds when it's paying for a project. And in order to get those bond markets to approve <laughs> that you we have to show what that revenue stream is. And that's where all those final details of all the assumptions of what the discounts, the amount, and all those those kind of hard decisions get made is is at that level in the investment grade strategy or analysis. The work here is to kind of help us figure out when we implement that what does it look like and what are the key attributes of it. I don't know if that fully helps, but it, it's it, it's kind of hard to have it without understanding some of the money side and the revenue side. But we also don't know those details either. 
So I apologize. I can't be more articulate than that. Yeah. And, you know, uh, to put this maybe the simplest way, maybe overly simple too, is I think, uh, you know, this is basically calling out that the Oregon Transportation Commission has set toll policy in the Oregon Highway Plan and the uh, Strax authority ends where that begins. And so when, you know, if there's some area where uh, we're looking at something that isn't consistent, then really there's there's no ability to, to change that policy uh, if that has been set by the state's transportation commission. But yes, I get this is a little bit ambiguous uh, and we'll have to navigate the, the waters of where the, the line may live. Mm -hmm. And Kelly offered a suggestion in the chat. Kelly, you want to share that? Yeah, I, I'm just thinking I, it, it might help make it a little clear if we take out the words criteria or principles from there and and just uh, leave it at tolling policy to govern toll programmer rates. I think the point here is that this group will not be advising and uh, on the policy part, right? Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I, I think that would, for me, I think I, I'm comfortable taking, because I don't, I worry, you know, that if we do get into the op toll operation side, and there is a, some criteria or, or some suggestions that come out of this, then we'd be stuck on that bullet point. So I'm okay. I think I see some more hands raised here, but I'm happy to hear what the other, the rest of the committees think. But I'm okay that if we're saying that out of scope is around policies, that will dictate um, the toll program. Um, but I also have a, I think, um, I don't know, like I'm trying to reconcile if we keep the word rate in there, um, then whatever this committee produces, uh, what is the likelihood that the OTC or ODOT will take it forward rather than say, you know, that this is what our toll policy dictates. So I'm just looking for some ways to, um, beef up the strength of this committee of whatever um, we produce moving forward. So I, I guess I'm suggesting adding the rates off as well, but T taking the rate part off. Yeah. Criteria or principle. And then the word rates at the bottom. Okay. Um, Madeline, can you capture that comment too? Uh, Lenny? Yeah, so my question started very similar to the commissioners, that those two, the, the two criteria of what's in scope, the four key things, and what's out of scope seem to be disconnected. But now that you talk about pulling certain parts out of the parts that are out of scope, to, to me, I really wonder, and, and I, this probably isn't going to be a popular sentiment, but I don't know that a tolling program is the place to address things like equity and climate change. Uh, those seem like they're very big issues and and they're very important, obviously, but I'm not sure I agree a toll system is the way to best address those. We don't address them in gas taxes. We don't address them in the mileage tax. We don't address them in registration fees. This highway tax, I, I'm assuming somebody else has made that decision that the toll program is different than those other funding programs, and that's why we're addressing them. But if it's already been decided, then what is it in the... Why is it part of this committee would be my question. It, it seems like they're foregone conclusions. And if they are, then why would we discuss them if we can't affect the rates or the tolling policy? Yeah, and so, I think Eric had started to answer that question, you know, answer that question a little bit in terms of that this is from the OTC. Um, but Eric, can you clarify for Lanny why, why those are there and how um, it's different? Yeah, I'll I'll do my best. So, Lanny, it's it's a good comment. Um, you know, when it comes to equity, again, that's a, a basic goal, a foundational goal of the OTC. They want to make sure, and and Erica talked about it that it's infused into everything we do and all the processes and decision making. Climate is also one of those um, goal areas that the commission is really trying to infuse into 
all of our programs and, and approaches. Where I think it really comes into play here, and this might be a little bit more in Garrett's realm, um, this committee, I think, is really helping us figure out from that equity side, how do you build a toll program that will be able to be implemented to help meet that goal and objective without, you know, deciding the rates, but it's going to be more the process, the procedures, you know, what the options for how to enroll, what does that look like, the details uh, of carrying that out. When it comes to climate, it's more about, do we still think the outcome of implementation of a toll program will help the state achieve its climate goals and objectives. Congestion pricing, I think, in its nature helps with that because it helps remove some of the stop and go traffic, which is actually some of the worst emissions for uh, for greenhouse gas uh, is when you when you have that stop and go traffic and that high level of congestion, it's worse than a steady flow rate. And that's what congestion pricing really is helping you do is maintain that steady flow rate, which should reduce overall um, emissions, but it also helps by hopefully promoting folks to take active transportation, public transportation modes, and maybe even change the type of trip from vehicular to some other uh, better better trip that's better for the environment um, as, as we kind of think about the climate aspect. So how does the program and the rules help support those those goals? That's why this is here because the commission wants to make sure it's in the in the mindset of ODOT, as well as all of our committees working on these things. How far can you go in the rulemaking? Well, that it might have some limitations there, but it's definitely a value. So that's how I maybe word it. I don't know, Travis, if you wanted to add anything else from those high level conversations or Garrett. Nope, I don't think so. It, it really is as the commission has laid out that as a foundation. And so uh, it needs to be in our thoughts as we move forward. All right. Thanks, you too, Phil. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Jamie. Uh, you know, I've I appreciate this uh, this conversation about in scope and out of scope, and I'll have to admit that you know it's it's uh, it's a nuance that um, uh, you know I have found a little confusing in trying to figure out why. Right, so, you know, policies versus rules, in scope out of out of scope. But I guess Eric said something that that. Um, just a few minutes ago that really helped to gel things in my mind, and that is the word how. And so, you know, uh, policies are the what, I think. Rules are the how. And that helped to clarify in my mind uh, some of the confusion around when we use the word policies and rules and rates and in, in the same sentence. Uh, that that helped to clarify for me exactly what we are supposed to do. So I wonder if the language in some of these sentences can be structured more along the lines of how we do something, how do we do this, how do we do that, and I think that helps to set the the idea that that's what rulemaking is all about, and might be a way to distinguish that from the what, which is the policy or policies. I don't know if that made any sense, but uh, uh, I'm just I'm just trying to help, uh, you know, clarify language because mm -hmm. semantics and language can be really confusing uh, when, when we approach words with slightly with our own perspectives and, and what they might mean. Yeah, Phil, and um, you know, I'm looking at the these two um, main bullets here where it starts, each one starts out with the rules that address customer accounts and how, uh, the rules that establish the process for how. And so we do have the how in both of those, but I'm wondering if there's a way to front load that a little bit more to make it more clear that, that, that we are talking about how we're doing it. Um, but yeah, I'm, glad, I'm happy, I'm glad, and I think other people are too, you know, kind of thinking, listening to your thought process about how you're connecting the dots. Ethan? Yeah, uh, Philip crystallized it better than I was about to. So I really, really appreciate that. I think that was a very good way to narrow our focus. So, I mean, from my perspective, and I think from, some of the participants in this committee who are working uh, on behalf of their industries. I mean, we're, we're, we're never shy about taking an opportunity to advocate for our industries, but I want to make sure that 
this is a credible process. And this committee's work, so long as it is narrow in scope and that it discharges its very specific assignment, the how, the opera, opera, operationalizing, we will do well. Um, from my perspective, I don't see our participation necessarily as an opportunity to take yet another bite at the policy and advocacy apple. Um, that discussion has happened and is happening in the legislature and its committees. It is happening in the policy committees that uh, ODOT and the OTC have convened around this process. So um, I don't wanna use, I guess I'll use the word, the phrase mission creep, but I really like what Philip said and Eric said about keeping the scope narrow. Uh, it makes it achievable and ultimately it builds credibility uh, that this committee has carried out its assignment and it builds public credibility. Uh, I think if we start diving into question, it's always good as members to question the assumptions, the policy assumptions that go into this process. But I think if we take on that uh, discussion, uh, this committee will very quickly lose credibility. It will become unmanageable. And uh, I think people will no longer want to participate. So I just like to echo that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm looking at, um, you know, these two bullets and Madeline, can you please make a note that I think what we want to do is just be more clear so that it would read something like rules that address how customers interact with the system, including um, rules that establish how rates are set or, you know, the process for how rates are, well, it's, that one already says it really. I think it's just, it's just moving that, moving that up and being more clear. Mike? Um, I wanted to <clears throat> talk about the last bullet and out of scope. Okay. Um, just so that I understand, because one of the key things about congestion management is reducing congestion. Congestion pricing is reducing congestion. And it seems to me that if we're gonna set rules for how we're gonna do the pricing and how we're gonna set these customer accounts up and how we're doing this, why wouldn't we be the ones to say, we're doing this to try to meet these goals? So, so you're talking- like We should have a say in what, what the system, I, I assume the system performance targets mean how you know how the you know, how the the process works and how are we going to measure how the process is working? Maybe that's not what it is. That's how I would read it. Um, Eric or Travis, can you talk about how the setting system performance targets wh where what table that happens at or how that happens? Yeah, I, I believe that this one was really focused on the transportation system in terms of how the uh, you know the roadway operates uh, primarily. Uh, in terms of congestion levels and, and some of the other pieces. And that really is going to be something that the Oregon Transportation Commission largely sets. And Garrett may have to correct me on this one, but I believe there might be some conversation around the, the Regional uh, Toll Advisory Committee. Uh, and obviously there'll be conversations with legislators. So really, again, it's sort of the uh, other bodies will set the what we're trying to achieve and then this group will help us think through how do we actually implement tolls in a way that gets to those performance targets. So have they told us what our targets are? No, there are not yet uh, performance targets that have been set. Then we can't do our work until that happens? So I think that there will probably be some work that will need to be done to ensure that we understand what those are. I mean, for example, as we're talking about uh, the low income toll program, uh, you know, as we discussed earlier, we're gonna need to understand what the impacts are on congestion. Uh, we may have some sort of general target set uh, that say, you know, what the, the legitimate uh, uh, or what the goals are going to be for, for congestion. Uh, ultimately, you know, the, the actual toll rates will be set by the OTC based on a whole range of performance targets that they're trying to hit in terms of congestion, 
uh, rerouting of traffic, GHG and others, and that they will have to provide some basis for for that for this conversations around this table. Yeah, I mean, we're there's a couple of different competing things, you know, equity, climate, competitiveness, or or free flow of traffic congestion. If we don't know what the goals are, how are we, you know, if if it's all about equity, we're not going to charge anybody anything, uh, you know, and and work on that aspect if if that's what we're tasked to do. But that's not what I I'm reading is we're tasked to do a bunch of different things, balance them, and we've got to figure out if it's more about congestion mitigation reduction, it's more about building new roads, it's more about funding, it's more. We need some targets, Travis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we'll have some fairly good. I mean, we we know directionally where we're we're going, but I think you're right that there will have to be some conversations uh, about what you know is acceptable levels of congestion versus uh, you know the trade offs that we're trying to achieve. And so it may not be that we have a hard you know you have to hit this target and that target and that target. It may be more some general you know we need significant congestion relief to be balanced with you know the impact on uh, low income Oregonians. So one of our in scope goals should have been meeting system performance targets. Where would that go, Mike? I was just looking at my hard copy. Uh, I don't know. Is it, I don't know if it's in there. Yeah. Um, where would it go? Yeah, let's just um, make a note. Madeline, if you can add a comment so we don't lose that. I think one of the things that is really helpful about this conversation is first, well, but we'll take a step back actually. First, I want to acknowledge that this is some of the hardest conversations that groups have about charters is the purpose, the mission, the you know, what are we trying to do here and making sure everybody's on the on the same page. So so I want to just acknowledge that. Um second, the um I think the other part that's really helpful as you're taking this on and trying to think, okay, how does, you know, how, how is my participation going to advance this um, is how we make sure that we're reconciling, like you said, the what's in and what's out and making sure that that jives. So um, I think this is really helpful. So we, like I said, we're not going to wordsmith this, but I just want to make sure that we get the concepts and the concerns and the, you know, if there are disconnects or things that aren't very clear that we've called those out and then you know, we will take that back and we will make it more clear. We'll make those connections. We'll add that language you know, that folks are um, asking for. And to Mike, to your point, there's some language in there in the in scope about reviewing and refining and adjusting rates. Uh, and that is essentially where we had been thinking about, uh, yeah, how, how and when rates are reviewed and adjusted. That was when we were thinking about in injecting those performance uh, measures that the OTC would set and they would modify uh, and that we would pro perhaps provide some, some direction on how that process should work uh, in order for the OTC to set rates that help achieve the performance measures. Yeah, so Madeline, can you put a comment there at that bullet just so we don't lose the thought about this is connected to the system targets? Anything else on the what's in scope or out of scope conversation people have questions about or wanting to tighten up or wanting to understand a little bit more about where something came from? I'm not seeing any. Ed Mallon, can you scroll? So let's take a look at guiding principles, and um, you know, let let me let's scroll through all of the guiding principles, and then pop back up to the top and see uh, what additions or suggestions or thoughts people have. Is holistic view the last one? No, there's two more, common ground and forward thinking.
What do people think about those guiding principles? They work for you? Any questions? People can support them. Mike? No, sorry. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I was, I was looking for the thumbs up thing, so I can I hit the wrong oh, thing. Oh, the thumbs up. Yeah, it's at the bottom with the raise hand. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. I did. Oh, well. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so if you click up. on, if you click on, you you can click on raise hand, and that will raise the hand. Oh, I see. There it doesn't have the reactions. Where is the reaction? Yeah, I didn't. Huh. You have yeah, to I'm click on up. more. The three dots where it says more. No, oh no, I don't know. Yeah, it's not there. No. I guess all we can do is raise hands. So I, I, I'm okay with it then. <laughs> okay. Elizabeth, you had your hand raised, or maybe you were trying to do it. That thumbs. was my thumbs up effort as well. Yep. Okay. Well, not seeing any other uh, need for dialogue on the on the guiding principles. Let's go ahead and move to membership, which we've actually already talked a, a little bit about. One of the things we explored when we were meeting with everyone individually is, and you, you see this when you look at this list here, as well as the slide that has all of the interests, you know, that are represented, is there are some little, um, there are some sort of buckets of folks, and there may be points as we're moving forward that we might want to, like, have a little convening of, like, freight interests, or have a convening of business interests, you know, and just kind of get, have some conversations with folks. So that's what that we mean by the um, subcommittees is needed if you know if we move forward or it could be that you know we're starting to get into the weeds on a particular part of a rule and there are a number of folks that represent different interests that want to kind of take it on in a in a work group mode with ODOT and then bring something back to the group so those are some different idea different ways that we might um, employ a subcommittee format and we, we won't know that until we get there but i just wanted to give people a little picture of what that might look like sean yeah thank you um in comment to the transportation reliant businesses specifically i have heard mentioned a number of times uh wanting to represent small businesses um and not only that but while i would argue that all businesses have some kind of transportation and reliance. It's really just impacts to businesses, be that through um, you know, diversion or through uh, financial impacts based off of road usage, et cetera. So uh, maybe just adding in uh, something about small business representation or, uh, or employer representation or something like that, that broadens, mm -hmm. broadens that piece out a little bit more than just transportation reliant businesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point because you heard like from Elizabeth that uh, with the West Side Economic Alliance that rep re represents a lot of smaller businesses. Um, certainly we have small business re representation on the committee with uh, folks like Shannon and others. Right. So. Thanks. How about moving to expectations? Should we keep scrolling? Is that all of them or are there some more on the next page? Oh, there's three more. People good with expectations? Any questions to clarify? Okay, we're just gonna move on. Up oh, there's a commissioner. Is that, is that you saying looks good? Shatreen says looks uh, good. <laughs> I'm having sort of like a um, question after you passed that sec section, um, and this is around the membership. Mm -hmm. um, but 
if we don't want to go back, I don't want to hold up the no, it's but it's, it's really, maybe it's a question and, and maybe a comment, um, but I'm wondering, um, I see equity and low income interest. And I think um, the question around the, the diversity of the representation of interest in this committee came up at the regional toll advisory committee. Um, and I think uh, the ODOT staff did a good job of sort of figure laying out some of the different uh, ways that is provide those, you know, those interest inputs come to this committee. And I think uh, EMAC was one of the uh, conduit that was identified, but I'm wondering a different group. I sort of had a, a thought um, around uh, our disability community. How do we infuse so that um, toll operations and whatever systems that we're uh, advising is um, will be just uh, systems or processes that work for uh, the communities around you know uh, the deaf community um, uh, or, or uh, immigrant and refugee who are uh, who face language barriers uh, and other disabilities. Uh, so I don't know um, where I'm going with this question or comment, but I am I would appreciate seeing, uh, especially a representation from the deaf community here as a membership, uh, because I think uh, um, the interactions and then the blind community as well, even though they're not driving or anything, but I think it will be a good way of um, just being thoughtful of how do we incorporate people who face barriers, but we want to uh, educate and help. So um, I think I'm advocating from the deaf community because my son um, wears cochlear implants. Uh, so I, I was just reflecting back, uh, how do we communicate to and provide representations? So. Mm -hmm. I guess, so, where does the disability community fit in? And the yeah, Commissioner, and I'm so glad to see Phil's hand raised because I was going to call on Park and Phil and see if they could expand on how EMAC is um, ad uh, addressing and incorporating accessibility questions as a part of their group. So, Phil? Well, you know, I, I, th I think uh, uh, the Commissioner's point is, 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 is a classical one in, in the sense of, of, you know, how, how detailed can we and should we be in identifying all of the communities that are essentially part of the uh, equity framework communities uh, to use a, a broad term and to use a, the, the the term that we use in emac so i'm i'm and and i'm wondering rather than you know essentially turn this list into a very very detailed and specific list of all the different um, uh, diverse communities that could be a part of this list, especially from an equity perspective, I wonder if it would be appropriate to have like an asterisk um, by equity and then have that refer to or actually list out somewhere as a footnote or whatever, uh, essentially a, a, a description of all of the communities that we have considered in EMAC as part of the equity framework communities because that would include people with disabilities and those who are hearing and vision impaired uh, you know and, and and so rather than lay those out here because then that would open the door to uh, you know being specific about a whole bunch of other interests and then this would very quickly become unwieldy yeah what do people think about that suggestion commissioner yeah, Dr. Wu, I think that's a really good, good, uh, um, yeah, I think that's a good compromise, I would say, and a good suggestion. I think it does. I think for me, what I was looking for is somewhat changing the dynamic within the start committee is like, think about it. If we had a deaf person participate in this committee, the dynamic will change because ODAD would have to bring in a, an interpreter, an ASL interpreter to communicate to that person. Person, and then that person will participate and provide impact. Impact. So I think I was 
more so what of trying to infuse somewhat of a uh, visible participation from that community to here rather than saying that like I think it's great I think we do need to put the asterisk and and figure out um, what is embedded um, but I was looking for more of like an actual yeah. you know like there's diversity and then there's visibly diverse you know so yeah well you know actually as a, as a just a, a point of thought um, you know, if, if we were truly thinking about um, diverse communities and those who have some form of, of disability, I mean, we would have interpretation services right now included, whether we have someone who's identified as being hearing disabled or not. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, we're in a virtual platform. So I don't know what that looks like, but the 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 the, the point being that um, that you know we would we would want to be making some accommodations, irrespective of whether we have a specific identified person mm-hmm. or not, because who knows who has a particular uh, disability. If I take my hearing aids out, I can't hear a thing. You know, so and, and I don't state that. Yeah, Phil, those are really good thoughts. And um, one of the uh, the things that we need to be compliant with is 508 compliance and making sure that materials that we produce are, um, you know, are accessible, that we have an opportunity for people to um, access information in a variety of ways. Um, and so it sounds like you're, you're pushing us to, to uh, do, do even more, be even more aware. Uh, Park? Yes, as a uh, representative from Ride Connection, I feel like I'm representing um, the group that we call transportation disadvantaged, uh, which includes people with disabilities and uh, people who can't drive, people who can't take uh, buses. Um, So I I think there is representation on this committee for disabled people and and I, I I'm part of that. <clears throat> Tra- uh, Travis, you're behind my there you are. Yeah, I, I uh, appreciate uh, the conversation and, and not to, this takes it in a slightly different direction, but just to note, you know, after the conversation around the RTAC uh, table on Monday, where it was it was pointed out by someone from Virginia Garcia Medical Center that we didn't have any BIPOC organizations on those track, and it was, uh, believe me, not for lack of trying, we invited quite a number of them. So we had an offline conversation, uh, Garrett followed up with that member of the, of the RTAC, uh, we had an internal conversation about uh, some of the supplemental efforts we will make to ensure that as we work through some of these issues, some of those groups that, that may not have a direct representative at the table uh, can have their issues heard as we work through some of these things. Uh, so this would be one that we should probably flag that as we're doing that, uh, you know, BIPOC, uh, people with low income outreach, uh, including the uh, community of people experiencing disabilities, would be something that we should absolutely put on a list for some very targeted outreach uh, for conversations uh, that would impact some of these rules. Yeah, that's a great clarification, Travis. And then the other part, Madeline, I want to make sure we don't lose is um, on the equity low income piece. Uh, Phil had offered a little asterisk there and a link to you know some connection back to uh, the EMAC. So making sure that we don't lose that thought as well. Park, I see your hand still up. Is it a holdover or do you have something else to add? I'm through. Okay, just for now. So let's go ahead and move on um, to, if folks are ready and ready to move on. I wanna look at um, expectations. We kind of jumped back up to membership, um, but we didn't finish expectations. Is there any, any questions or comments, uh, other additional considerations around expectations? Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm not seeing any. So how about we move on to meeting structure and operations? So um, as evidenced by our meeting today, and again, acknowledging our viewers, um, these meetings are open to the public live streamed. Um, we will have, they will all be live streamed. We will always have the slide that says how the public can get comments to all of you and how they can get comments to the OTC um, so that they, their input can be part of this process. So that's part of the open meetings part that you see there. Um, all materials are posted on the website. So I don't know if there's any, let's keep going down. Any other, any thoughts or on um, open meetings? We had, a, we just had a good conversation about ensuring uh, what we refer to as 508 compliance and accessibility, um, making sure that we're considering those. about meeting operation up hand, Shannon. Yeah, I just wanna say, I, you know, I don't know, I know it says they're gonna be open and they'll post on the ODOT uh, website, but I don't know, I mean, that means someone has to go to the ODOT website and look and specifically look for this information. And I don't know if there's a way that things can be um, sent out to the public so it's a more open process where people are not searching for the information and more at the you know, pushing the information out to them and giving them opportunity to be involved instead of having to search where to get involved. And, and Shannon, are you specifically thinking about that, you know, folks shouldn't have to go to like the ODOT website, website and figure out where, um, you know, how to access this information. It should be really easy and clear. Yeah, and or like, do they know that we're having these? Does anybody know we're having these meetings for them to give public input? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see you Kelly's know, hand than, up. Yeah. Oh, I actually I see Hannah's hand up. I was, I was gonna, gonna say, where's Hannah? If Hannah was still there, yeah. So she can address how that hap how that is handled. Hi, Hannah. Hi. Um, yeah, one would love your help to you know get more so we have a newsletter um and that's a really good way that goes out monthly um it has tolling information in there as well as um information uh about the rose quarter and the i-205 improvements it's from the urban mobility office um it would be great we can i can send you um some good information to get more people to sign up for the newsletter um and so that goes out every month um with that list, we also send out um, meeting notifications. And so it has all of the advisory committees. So it would have the RTAC, it would have EMAC, it would have this committee. Um, and then it also has the links for the, for the committee meetings, but it also has the direct link for each committee page. Um, so helping with that navigation, going straight to the committee page. Um, we do social media posts too, um, and partner toolkits for notifications, also trying to kind of come at it from a couple different angles. So it's not just someone receiving an email from ODOT, but maybe receiving an email from, you know, a community liaison or someone they know or, or a partner agency. So um, would love to work with you to help us, um, you know, stop going out to the same people and, and widen the well of who we're reaching with these notifications. And if you have other ideas too, you know, we're, I'm here. Yeah. So can you share with us like a, like any Facebook post or, or anything like that? Tell us where they're at. And I can, push it out to like the community forums and stuff like that because I think that would be like the easiest way um if you do if you are doing you know social media posts or whatever to push those out I would I would love to do that also too if there are any on. community newsletters or you know if there's any deadlines for when you're putting things out through your network anyone on this committee um let us know so we can make sure we make those deadlines Thank you, Hana. So uh, meeting operations. 
Kelly, do we want to chat just a little bit about where we're land, where where what we're thinking about in terms of the cadence of the meetings and um, the schedule? Seems like a good thing to do right now. Sure. So I think I think we landed on we're thinking about the fourth Friday of each month. Is that what you mean, Jamie? That yeah. getting that uh, yeah. So yeah, we're looking at um, fourth Fridays of the month um, and. Uh, meeting monthly. However, depending on kind of where we're at with the set of rules that we're working on, some are going to, some are probably going to be easier than others. Um, and so ones that are maybe going to need a little more conversation, we may, you know, want to see if you're available for um, a second meeting during a month to try to keep the work moving forward. Um, so, but cadence wise, we're, we're looking at monthly and I think we decided on morning so like 8 30 9 o'clock start to noonish mm -hmm. yeah so more on that so that would mean that we're looking we're we're looking at uh February 24th for our next for our next meeting not it's not set in stone Ethan we just we you know we, we wanted to start somewhere and um, you know, there's lots of ways that we can pull the group to under to better understand what people's flexibility is or schedule constraints. And uh, you know, one of the one of the parameters that we start with is, all right, you know, the ODOT folks that need to be there. What does your schedule look like? And what can we offer to the group? And then, you know, what what are the conversation needs in terms of cadence? And then, what does that look like? So, um, so yeah, not set in stone, Ethan. Um, more to come on that. And so it sounds like as a team, we probably need to take a, uh, do some kind of a poll, a uh, little survey for everybody about, you know, kind of day of week and, and uh, so we can make sure we can set our, our meeting time. Are there other folks that have concerns about a Friday? If we were to land on a, a once a month Friday meeting that was like three or four hours long? Shannon? Fridays are a little tougher for me just because the staff, uh, but I, I can make it work, but it, it, it is a little more of a problem. Yeah. Um, Commissioner? Yeah, Fridays are tough for me as well. Um, is there a way to do a, a dutiful for the community? Yeah, oh, sure. Here? Yep, yeah, we'll do a poll. We, you know, we just, we as a team started thinking about the cadence and a regular, um, uh, schedule and that's where we, we we you know it was a proposal we wanted to propose it so we'll we'll circle back on the on the regular meetings um kelly is there anything else you wanted to highlight under the meeting operations i know we talked about uh oh thanks lauren i know we talked about um virtual meetings are our go to we talked about we did test the waters in the individual meetings with everybody about the possibility of an in-person at some point and people seemed amenable to that with lots of notice <clears throat> and uh, we're going to do our best to get agendas and materials out a week in advance uh, i know we've got five days here but um i feel we're feeling like that we'd really like to get it out a week in advance so that's what we're going to strive for any question? Any other questions about meeting operations, or or considerations? Things that we need to be aware of. Kelly, anything else you want to highlight? The only thing I was going to add is, um, so yes, we're going to start to get the materials out um, a week ahead. Um, that that, however, the exception to that is the public comments. So as, when we get the public comments in, yep. those will be we give them till eleven o'clock the day prior to your meeting. Uh, to submit, and then those will be pulled and sent to you the day before. Perfect. Yeah, and we did put that on the slide up front for the public too. Um, so that's a great clarification. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. Let's look at meeting attendance and ground rules, Madeline. If you want to scroll up and so we just ask that people let us know as quick, you know, when you can, uh, if if you're not able to attend. You can certainly get us your comments in advance. You know, we'll do our best to get you materials a week in advance with whatever the questions and agenda topics are. So you'll have time to um, get us materials. 
the ground rules are you know, really similar to what we put up on the meeting guidelines slide at the beginning. I think the only um, addition here is the uh, avoid side conversations or the distracting behaviors. And that really plays out in uh, having conversations in the chat when we're in a virtual environment and other distracting behaviors. I'm sure we all have our Zoom stories of where how people have pushed the limits <laughs> in a Zoom environment of what might be tolerable. So just we ask that you be respectful. I have a standing desk, so I tend to walk around a lot in my office. Mm -hmm. So I'll turn my I will turn my camera off when I need to walk around in here to get my steps in. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know, Ethan. I have a stand-up desk too. And um, just so long as everybody's wearing pants, we're good with the walking around. <laughs> Always wearing anything pants. Else? <laughs> <laughs> anything else about meeting ground rules or, or anything else, uh, suggestions, comments, questions before I, we keep scrolling? We're, we've only got another page, I think, page two pages, we're, we're nearly done. So we're, we're really close. Authorities and input process. Kelly, you wanna just talk a little bit about this, what, why this is important, why this is here? I, sure, I think this kind of ties back a little bit to uh, the conversations we may have about scope and the, um, the different, um, groups that are involved in here, but this again is just kind of to lay out that clarity that, um, you know, it's really ODOT's job to create the rules. So, um, and, and um, the OTC has the authority to set those and adopt them. So that's in their, their lane in terms of decision-making authority. And then the secretary of state has the authority to enact those rules. So just to kind of that official authority chain um, we just wanted to make sure that that was clear. So in, in other words, this there's there's no um, authority decision-making to approve rules at, in the STRAC, it's, but this is your kind of how that approval and authority lays out for rulemaking. And we've really had some conversation about this already. I mean, we've presented it earlier. We talked about it earlier in the in the charter document about kind of what's in, what's out. Any questions people have about authorities and input process? Mm -hmm. Clarifications, suggestions. Okay, let's keep scrolling. Stakeholder groups and engagement. We talked about this, about the, you saw the chart and we sent that out with who's doing what and what each, everybody's role is. And we've got some liaisons here, um, tying back to those groups. And so we should always feel free to uh, lean on them um, to ask them questions and carry things back. And engagement, we heard a little bit from Hannah about the broader engagement uh, process and how STRAC fits in with that. Any thoughts or questions here? Okay, how about schedule? Oh, sh there, Shatrine. So sorry about that. Oh, I was, no, pretty, no, I was trying to read through <laughs> and I was wondering if we just go right back up a little bit to the mm -hmm. engagement, I think it was. Yeah. Do you think we should put something about, because I see, of course, you know, you've got the businesses and transportation systems, you know, does it apply? Is it should it be applicable to put in tourism in there for the growth of our community? Like I'm just thinking future things like that. Does that fit in there, or is that not something we can should consider? I was just trying yeah. to figure out. It does. I know, 
We impacted. talked about that. Yeah, we talked yeah. about that in our interview. What do you yeah. think, Kelly? Is this where this would go? Um, I think, I guess my question would be, yes, and um, do we want to get that specific? I mean, maybe maybe we need to look at broader words to be more, you know, to, to reflect that broad spectrum, because tourism is one of, you know, many. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah, maybe we just need to think about how can we broaden that a bit. Um, and we're also just as a FYI, we're we're starting to talk to about different language that's more inclusive. Um, so the word stakeholder actually is probably something we might want to adjust um, mm. to a different wording. Well, and, and I think you're absolutely correct about the broadness. So maybe it's more of the base of the economic prosperity or, you know, something broader in that aspect. Yes. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And now sure. you could maybe also add a, just a note to um, look at different words for stakeholder. Yeah, and maybe this is where you're going to go, Sean, but I see, you know, businesses, commuters, and interest groups, but I, not necessarily users. Mm-hmm. That's exactly where I was going to go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I knew it because we had that conversation. Yep. Mm-hmm. Users and, um, you know, residents was another group that I was thinking of here as well, mm-hmm. and that's obviously captured in users, but just using broader language to incorporate multiple yeah groups. I'm also curious just on the terminology, just to make sure that I'm getting uh, getting it dialed in in my mind as well. So uh, that first line there, the rules subject to the Strax advice will affect all those who use and benefit from tolled facilities. Does that cover both project tolling as well as congestion pricing facilities, or would tolled facilities be specific to uh, you know those, those project tolling as, a, as, as opposed to congestion pricing? Just want to make sure it covers both. I, I'll let Travis uh, correct me, but I, I believe it's intended for both. It, yeah. So maybe we need to tweak yep, that thing right. a little bit to clarify, but it, it's it's intended for both. Yeah, you're right, Kelly. Mm-hmm. Great. Just want to make sure that covered it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Shannon. Um, I just noticed that it those who use and benefit, but what about the people who are going to be hurt by it with the diversion part and stuff like that? Should we not be hearing their point of view? So you're- you're, uh, Neighborhoods that are gonna be impacted by diversion. Yeah, so so you're reacting to the word benefit, the rules subject to this, uh, to the Strax advice and will affect all those who use and benefit. So I think what I'm hearing from you, Shannon, is, um, it, you know, maybe, uh, and are impacted by it? Yeah, that would be better. Might be a benefit. That's not necessarily a benefit to everybody. <laughs> mm-hmm. As we saw in the word cloud, projecting yeah. out future customers' words, not all benefit. Yeah. Other other input uh, or conversation around engagement? We only have one more little section on schedule. Hey, Sean, your hand is still up. Do you have something else to add or is that just a holdover? No, nope, there. Sorry about that. Thank you. No worries. Okay, so schedule. So Kelly, do you want to just mm. talk a moment about schedule? We've, we've talked about it a couple points in the meeting today, but anything more you want to add here? Uh, the only thing I would add there is that um, there are, you know, we've talked a little bit about some of the inputs um, into this process. So while we've laid out um, a schedule that kind of takes us through to the spring of 2024, um, you know, I think just keeping in mind that um, that will be based on other things that come into play to help inform this. So we talked a little bit about um, those, uh, 
system performance targets, right? So that's an example. And there, there are other studies going on that will help inform some of these things down the road. So I just I just want to um, folks to know that the schedule, um, it, it's a tightrope between being locked in and having a little bit of flexibility. So um, right now, you know, we're looking at, you know, we talked about that two to four, six, I mean, two to four month uh, window. It's really probably more like six to eight months of work for this group for that that part of the rulemaking process. So, um, well, we have an example in there that kind of lays out the process um, and the schedule. But they'll, there's probably going to be some refining to that. I'll just say. Questions, thoughts, other considerations about the schedule. Not seeing any. The last page is the agreement to sign. So, um, so as I said, let me just. The next steps are: we will take this, the results of this conversation. We'll make some um, uh, refinements to it. We'll send it out as a PDF fillable uh, document for folks to sign, and um, it'll be our foundational document for our work forward. So, so that's the any. Did we have any questions about our next steps or? How we're moving forward. Um, the other observation and reflection I just want to share is um, this was, you know, walking through this charter is a little bit of a test of how we're going to work together to walk through language in a rule and um, how we're going to, you know, ask questions of each other and push back and participate and um, and arrive at some things that, you know, we could say, yeah, you know, we could live with that or that works for me. You know, I think when we had all of our individual conversations, one of the things we all agree is that, you know, this isn't, it, this isn't necessarily a consensus based group. We're not looking for achieving, um, you know, broad group consensus. It really helps the OTC if we can arrive at things that the group support and understand, and we can convey that level of um, you know, that level of agreement forward. Um, and we'll do our best to reconcile and work with differing of opinions to the extent that, you know, we can in the time that's allowed. Um, but I just really appreciate how everybody engaged in the charter. Um, and uh, that's a good uh, example of how we'll work together moving forward. So the only other thing on our agenda, uh, we have just an open space for some general questions and answers. Um, you know, things that we didn't talk about that are on your mind, um, you know, any, any other things that you want to ask the project team about. And then we just have a, a wrap up slide with next steps. And uh, Madeline of our team, who's so great, actually put together a uh, an in Zoom um, scheduling poll so we can make the good use of our time just to kind of narrow down um, some uh, days of the week and times of the day that might work for folks just to get a good sense of that. So we can do that after the uh, Q&A. So what questions do people have at this point? We just worry it all out. Observations, reflections, I shared uh, observation and a reflection of my own. Any observations and reflections folks want to share? Phil? Yeah, I, I, I just want to pig, piggyback on what you said, Jamie. I, I really appreciate the quality of today's uh, conversation because, frankly, I think going into this, uh, it wasn't clear to me how, um, uh, how well, how contentious, uh, you know, comments might be or, or how quote, positional people might be. Um, and I think it's really very reassuring and uh, I think very exciting that, that you know, if, assuming that the nature of this conversation, today's conversation goes forward, I think this will really be fantastic. Thanks for that, Phil. Other observations or reflections, any questions for the team or each other? You can ask questions of each other too. Shitreen? I just wanted to say, I appreciate the clarity through all of it. You know, there were some, I loved the part and I'm trying to remember which one said it. Cause I, I was like, I was writing down the notes, but where we talked about that, the policies are the what 
and the rules or the how and just kind of honing that in and really understanding that and doing the best we can as a group. I, I'm excited to see who's here and all the things that are being brought to the table. And I think we can do some really make some really good um, striving standards towards making some good role making. Thanks for that, Shatrin. Other observations, reflections, or questions for each other or the team? I'm not seeing any. So I just before we break, I just would be remiss if I didn't thank all of you for the amount of time uh, you spent today. We're about, what, 17 hours into this, it feels like, but I think it's only more like five. And, you know, to, to uh, Dr. Wu's point, we selected you all in part because of who you are and because we saw you as people who would not just be position takers. We recognize you all need to represent who you're uh, representing, your, your industry, your constituents, uh, but you all were people who, uh, as we looked at your resumes, looked at your background, we saw a lot of uh, good thinking ability and, and ability to come forward and not just be position taking. Uh, so we, you've already shown that you're going to be incredibly valuable. Great questions today uh, that were were really uh, on point, uh, and just the discussion around the charter showed you're going to add value as we work through these issues uh, and help us do a better job. So thank you for that. Thanks for that, Travis. So I want to move, make space for um, Garrett or Kelly or other team members. Anything else you want to? Add before I move to the next step slide and our Zoom scheduling poll. I just want to echo Travis's sentiment. Um, I'm really excited about all of you and this group. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to um, the next several months working together. Yeah, and same over here, took the words out. Uh, just thankful for all the time you took today and uh, look forward to diving into it. Great. Uh, we did have a request from I think it was Hannah or Kelly, I can't remember who, that we do a group photo. And so if everyone is comfortable to be on camera, um, you know, on video, we'll just do a screenshot photo of everyone. I see that uh, you know, Mark and um, Lauren and Marie, and if, you, if you're comfortable being on screen, go ahead and, uh, and do so. And then we can do a screenshot. Thank you, Marie. My main computer, the internet sort of went out on it. So I went on to into my workout room and went on my iPad in there. So I don't know if I can be, if you see me on that one or not. Yeah, no, you look good, Mark. Okay. Oh, Lauren's in the car. That's right. She did give us a heads up about that. Sorry, Lauren. And then uh, KW team, go ahead and be on screen too. Yeah, I think that's everybody we're going to get. Where's Cheryl? Travis? <laughs> yeah, where's Travis? There. There he is. Sorry, I had the director come by and knock on my door about something. So I had to take a brief moment. You couldn't pull the director in and, you know, have a, <laughs> have a buddy shot right there. <laughs> okay. Hey, I think this is it. Okay. Give There's us a countdown. Two people for one. So I'm going to have to take a couple. So everybody just be smiling the whole time, as pretty as you can. Okay, one, two, three. One more. One, two, three. All right, is that good? Sorry, we need just one more. Sorry, everyone. Oh. <laughs> okay, sorry, your mouth must be tired. Okay, ready? One. Two, three. Great, thank you so much. Great, thank you. Okay, Madeline, let's put up that next step slide and launch the Zoom poll for scheduling. Sure. <clears throat> It says host and panels cannot vote. 
for me. Yeah, I'm I'm not yeah. able to actually yep. get the to click check. Problem. Looks like we need to change the um, permissions. Allow panelists to participate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, let me know if it goes through now. Looks like it still says host and panelists. Still says. Uh, still says uh, we can't vote. How about now? Mm. Still not working? Okay. Well, if you could just type in the, the chat then um, a day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, uh, maybe your top two choices of what works best. Okay. Well, we tried to be clever on the fly. Thanks, Madeline. Um, so, so for next steps, uh, we talked a little bit already about, um, you know, we're trying to land on a regular cadence. Uh, we're thinking monthly meetings make sense. We're thinking uh, meetings that are, you know, probably about three hours in length. If we're going to meet monthly, maybe sometimes there'll be a four our meeting, we'll, we'll figure that out if it makes sense to do two meetings or do a longer meeting. Um, we also uh, will give some consideration to whether or not we do a meeting in person and when that might be and give people lots of heads up about that. And that would probably be a longer meeting to make it worthwhile for people to travel. Um, so more to come on that. And uh, coordination with other committees. Kelly, what were we, what were we gonna say about that? Um, I think just that we, we talked a lot about that today, um, but uh, we're also looking at um, putting a plan together that specifically identifies where um, those connections need to be um, more deliberately. So uh, according to, you know, EMAC and um, the RTAC for, for two, um, but just how we coordinate with them specifically in terms of uh, when do we get input from them? Um, th those types of things. So, uh, Hannah, is there anything you want to add to that? But she might have gone, but... Uh, oh, Sorry, okay. I was unmuting. No, nothing to add. Okay. Yeah, Kelly, if I can comment, um, you mm -hmm. know, as a representative from EMAC, I think I really will appreciate uh, some coordination uh, so that it's not just a willy-nilly, uh, oh, he said this and they said that, and you know, you know, take it for what it's worth, kind of thing. Right, exactly. Yeah. So we want to have a, a kind of a clear plan about and deliberate around those interactions, um, and as well as the updates to the OTC. So one of the things uh, you know you'll see in the rulemaking process, the OTC has. Uh, the decision authority to adopt the rules that come out of this group. Um, however, we're not going to wait till the end to do that. So there will be times that we're going to be engaging the OTC along the way. Um, so that um, that that just is in all our best interests, I think, to um, uh, bring things to them as we go versus waiting to the end. And the other thing, has there actually been? Oh, I was ahead, just, sorry. Please. Has there been any thought to actually having one of the OTC members sit in um, on these committee meetings, just like they do with EMAC? Travis, thoughts on that? I don't. I don't remember us specifically talking about that. No, we haven't talked about that. And part of that is that the OTC oftentimes feels pretty tapped out between all the various committee assignments that they have. And now that we have three of these toll related groups, uh, it would be a substantial amount of, of work uh, for them to, to sit in on all three, but it's something we can consider. I know they're gonna be very interested in this work, that's for sure. And um, you know, your, your project team here, 
um, is really trying to think about how to make sure that we're utilizing your time in the best, most efficient, uh, respectful way possible. And, um, and also recognizing that there's internal ODOT folks that are working through information to bring to various committees. And one other idea that we've kicked around is potentially having uh, joint meetings where we can bring information together or workshop style format, you know, so, um, so that way people are getting all the information at once. And, you know, we just don't know enough to know what that would look like or when that would be. But um, just I want to give you a sense of the kinds of things we're thinking about, about how to um, build in more uh, continuity among all the groups about, um, you know, respecting the different forums and the tables that the groups are working in, but also trying to be respectful and efficient with people's time. Kelly, anything else we want to say about next steps? I don't think so. Think Garrett, we... anything from you? Uh, no, I think you covered it well there and looking forward. All right. Well, I think the last slide is just a, a wrap up slide of somebody building a part of a toll tower. There they are. <laughs> So thank you, everybody. Um, I'm really pleased to give you a half hour back of your day. That is just a gift that um, I don't know that we'll hit that every time, but uh, I really uh, am happy to do that. Thank you for everyone's participation. And uh, thank you for uh, members of the public who are watching us today uh, through the live stream. Really appreciate you sticking with us and joining us today. So bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, all. Thank you.